Yeah, uh, good evening. Uh, good evening to the uh, fourth webinar of uh, MSI and CMS uh, on superficiality uh, of part of the superficiality superficiality course on controversies in uh, vascular uh, surgery uh, neurosurgery. This week, the this month, the theme is uh, vascular tumors uh, and of spinal cord and and the uh, column. Uh, so we have. Uh, uh, three speakers uh, speaking on uh, Dr. Satish, who will speak on hemangioma, vertebral hemangiomas, uh, controversies in management. We have Dr. Babu, who will uh, speak on uh, treatment and controversies management of spinal cavernomas. And we have Dr. Rajkumar Despande, and he'll be speaking on uh, the controversies uh, in management of uh, spinal dural vascular malformations. Um, before we start off the lecture, I'll request uh, and Dr. Clemens, and to speak uh, on behalf of uh, CNS, uh, the motto of conducting this uh, uh, collaboration webinars, and followed by Dr. Muthukumar, who is the present secretary of Neurological Society of India, to speak on the present plans of collaboration with CNS, and and I request Dr. V P Singh, who is the future president of the elect president elect of NSI, to speak on what are the future plans of collaboration of NSI and CNS. Uh, Professor Clemens, who is the in, uh, chairman of the international uh, liaison between uh, of CNS, uh, I'll request him to please give a, uh, introductory comments. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, I mean, I'm very excited to be here for the fourth time now. Um, this has uh, been a great collaboration and uh, it's a great series of webinars. Um, and I hope that we will continue in this uh, vein um, going forward, you know, COVID or not, uh, and we are making steps, um, and we'll talk about this in a second. Uh, but I really want to congratulate you in particular for like pulling all this together um, so far. Uh, this has been really exciting and a really good exchange of ideas. Um, and uh, like I said, I'm, I'm very, uh, you know, happy to be here learning from you guys um, and, and really bringing our perspective to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, without further ado, um, I'll pass it on to Dr. Muthukumar. Thank you very much. Good evening to our colleagues in India and good morning to all our friends in the US. Uh, I became a member of CNS way back in 1994 and NSI, uh, our organization has a long and fruitful association with CNS for the past uh, several years. We had a sign in MIU somewhere in the year 2014, which was renewed in 2017. And since last year, uh, NSA has become a strategic partner of CNS. To further our friendship and collaboration, we have started uh, uh, interacting in the super specialty CME. For those who were not aware of the concept of super specialty CME, it's my duty to tell you that this was conceived. This is practically the brainchild of my immediate predecessor and the pres present president elect and co panelist, Dr. VP Singh. The idea of the super specialty CME was to was to encourage young neurosurgeons to subspecialize because it's no longer sufficient to be jack of all trades, and uh, that's the purpose of this. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we were not able to hold the physical meeting. As we all of us know, every difficulty provides us an opportunity, and we, to a pleasant surprise, we found instead of having a one day webinar or one day CME. Now we have a four webinars spread over four months with good participation with our colleagues from uh, CNS. And I should thank Dr. Clemens and uh, all the other members of CNS for their enthusiastic participation in this uh, super special the CME. And with those few words, let me hand over to my uh, colleague and uh, president elect of NSA, Dr. VPC. Hi, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, this concept of super speciality CME really came because we wanted to be more inclusive for all our members. You know, there was a need, there was a sort of undercurrent of feelings that, you know, all the senior people are hogging on the nine night all the time. And uh, that's the time when we thought we should give credence to our junior members, give them the opportunity and see what they wanted. But although we had a CME which was covering everybody, we felt that uh, we would need to develop the super specialities and get people interested because there are several centers in our country 
where all the super specialities are not available. So we thought that all our junior colleagues, after passing their exams at least, should have some exposure to the <coughs> uh, specialities which they did not have enough exposure to. And with this, we designed a three day, a two and a half day program. They would take them to an isolated space, a scenic space, but you know, where they could not run away and go outside seeing. But you know, we would have them in a hotel, in a good resort. And then for two and a half days, we would brainstorm them on a particular speciality. And we thank our uh, colleagues in the pharma industry who supported us this endeavor. And this became hugely popular. We would have roughly about 80 people back for two and a half days, mainly local faculty and one international faculty. And this was the opportunity where the seniors were not there and the juniors could ask whatever questions they want without any hesitation. So this became very successful and Manas has taken it forward as the chairman of the Board of Education. This year, there was a special challenge because we could not physically meet, but I think we more than made up for it with these excellent set of four webinars. Our collaboration with CNS has been very strong. It started off nearly six, seven years ago, and uh, we had our first joint meeting in New Orleans. And then from there, we found the uh, collaboration to be mutually beneficial on both sides and it has grown by leaps and bounds. And uh, we thank CNS for being a partner with us uh, in this super speciality course. And thanks Clemens for all your support and the active help that you've done. We do hope our friendship is going to continue. It's certainly going to increase and we made wind bridges across the continents and we do learn from each other. And it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you all for the uh, uh, futuristic comments. And then uh, uh, we'll, so we'll start off with the webinar. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Satish, uh, uh, who is uh, the director of uh, the spine surgery at uh, Sakra Hospital, Bangalore. And uh, he, uh, he has 20, 24 years of experience, I think, uh, of uh, neurosurgery after completing his residency. And uh, uh, he did his training at Bangalore Nimhans, uh, and then he he worked at uh, Wayne State University, uh, Detroit, uh, with Dr. Rangachari and uh, Dr. Paul, and um, and then he has been working on spine since for the past twenty years. And in addition to do, he does also some brain. And I request Dr. Satish to speak on controversies in management of uh, vertebral hemangiomas. So this can I please can share your screen. Can you see? Thank you, Manas. Thank you for the uh, introduction. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, the topic chosen for me was uh, is uh, controversies in the treatment of vertebral hemangioma. So the objective is very clear here. What are the controversies? And is there any recommendation available for the treatment of vertebral hemangioma? Let us look into that. Uh, the hemangiomas, as all of you know, is a vascular malformation within the bony component of the vertebrae. And uh, luckily, its incidence is about 10 to 12 percent, but symptomatically, you know, present, symptomatic presentation is less than 1 percent. And uh, in that, you know, less than 1 percent of it is aggressive. And most of the symptomatic vertebral hemangiomas, out of which 55 percent present only with the pain alone, and another 45% of the pain with neurological symptoms. So the Anakin classification, all of you must be knowing, is the standard classification which is given to any of the benign tumors of the vertebrae. And Anakin classification also mentions about the three types, that is the latent variety, active variety, and aggressive variety. And all these three things can happen with a hemangioma. However, there is significant controversy whether we can use the same classification for the vertebral hemangioma because the, especially with the surgical recommendations, which are given from the Anakin classification like marginal excisions are a wide excision, including the adjacent structures, which are not required in vertebral hemangiomas because very rarely this will turn ever into malignancy. 
So that is the first controversy. So considering that variety of classifications for it have been described, one such classification is by Klimo et al, who has done significant work on the vertebral hemangioma, but this is not practically uh, uh, possible and not been elucidated in the peer review. And as of now, it is a classification which can be utilized from the scoring perspective for learning purpose, but still not widely utilized. Considering the management options, variety of management options have been provided for the vertebral hemangioma. So like vertebroplasty or a simple direct radiation and uh, the patients coming with alcohol injections and the uh, embolization techniques, or is it the fusion technique with stabilization in this patient along with the decompression? There are many ways which are available and which way to take and where to go is a significant controversy. Let us look into one by one about the treatment of the vertebral artery in vertebral hemangioma and its evolution. So decompression surgery way back in 1920 itself has been described in every literature in the world. Radiation therapy has been utilized in a way back in 1930s. And in 1987, the significant work has been done on vertebroplasty as one of the simple and the best method for the treatment of vertebral hemangioma treatment, especially for the symptomatic variety. And in 1994, ethanol injection came into the picture because we were start, you know, using you know, ethanol into a variety of the neurosurgical procedure and it was tried even in vertebral hemangioma. And uh, the, by 19, late 1990s, the uh, intervention procedures uh, took over from the cranial to the spinal area. The embolization technique were described in 1998 and by 2009 when after our significant experience with the gamma knife and the cyber knife treatment for the cranial surgeries in our stereotactic surgery has been applied into vertebral hemangiomas and which one is the best among all these things is still a controversy and the treatment of this whether a surgeon sees this patient in the periphery uh, in the remote part of any country or in the major setup, which is a tertiary care center or level three centers, you know, the treatment varies from person to person. But if the patient come to you in the periphery with a neurological symptom, the treatment is different from where it patients arrives in the tertiary care centers. Let us look into one by one. That's why it's the controversy. So there are numerous controversies. The usual controversies are, what is the best method of treatment of vertebral hemangioma? Is the PMMA versus ethanol injection of shrinking the you know, tumor, which one is the best? And can radiotherapy can be used as a sole treatment? You know, are the controversies. From the surgical point of view, is decompression should be done before or after the injection of the cement or ethanol injection? When to fuse in these patients, if at all required? Is it an open method? or minimally invasive method is required? Is there a radical excision like a spondylectomy has to be done in every patient? These are the controversies which we are going to look in in today's presentation. So what exactly is the aim of treating any vertebral hemangioma? You know, especially in only one person with a symptomatic patient, there should be some aim as a surgeon we should be having in these patients. So first one is whenever there is an epidural component, which is having a compression either on the cord or on the nerve root. The first thing every surgeon think is how to shrink this epidural component so that the canal becomes wider and the pressure on the neural structure go away. Then by doing this shrinking procedure, are we creating any instability? And if so, how to stabilize these patients? And when we are doing both these things, shrinking and stabilization, are we avoiding the complication? And at the same time, going to prevent the recurrence. And in, with all these things, at the same time, there should be a significant success in these patients with the least neurological deficit, which patients will have. And most of these patients should get back to their normalcy is the goal of treatment of vertebral hemangioma. So let us look into one by one with these five goals. Looking at the vertebroplasty, what, how exactly it works? It works first as a shrinkage of the tumor, because it's very well known that when you inject the cement and with its exothermic, you know, one, it occupies the space. Second, with its exothermic action, you know, it shrinks even the 
you know the amount of the tumor which has come into the epidural space where it has not been filled with the cement it still shrinks the tumor and in addition you know it takes you know gives the great mechanical support to already collapsing vertebrae and also takes away the local pain by ablative technique and symptomatic extravasations i know is known but it is very very less less than 1% especially symptomatic one and whenever we are doing this kind of the procedure case selection proper technique especially use of the high viscosity cement significantly reduce the complication to less than 5% so in this way the five points which i was talking about you know does it produce a shrinkage yes excellently it shrinks it does give the stabilization it is less complicated and it definitely reduces the recurrence but you know not in every case where you cannot you know if there is a slightly uh, tumor coming laterally from the pedicle area where you cannot significantly put the cement it might have a recurrence but the success rate is quite significant in these patients so in conclusion from the vertebroplasty is it can be used as isolated procedure a standard care in locally symptomatic vertebral hemangioma without a neural symptom can be done and adjuvant procedure of vertebral hemangioma with neural symptom along with the de decompression surgery for the tumor shrinkage as well as local pain relief can be done with this you know vertebroplasty there are significant you know uh, uh, literature available in the uh, peer reviewed journals the klimenov the classification which i mentioned earlier you know he's the one who has done with the highest level of uh, studies and overall if you look at these uh, five studies which i have quoted here among the highest number of cases which they have it uh, there is pmma is safe and effective in local pain relief it does give the stabilization with a low tumor recurrence and in a, you know it is aggressive it is safe and effective in aggressive vertebral hemangioma even with epidural extension so looking at the surgical management it has become standard of the care in aggressive vertebral hemangioma with a neurological deficit you know in the recent modalities to reduce intraoperative bread loss so there are three things which we always take from the surgical point of view one is decompressive surgery alone decompression with a laminectomy and fusion and spondylectomy with fusion let us look into these things with the five points which i was talking you know which including the in block spondylectomy and sometime intralesional spondylectomy with a deep bulking so if you look at the deep decompressive laminectomy most commonly performed surgical procedure in aggressive vertebral hemangioma with deficit especially in the peripheral centers where there is no facility available for biplane imaging where the surgeon may not be very confident in putting either the the cementing technique or alcohol therapy where radiation may not be available if the patient comes in with rapidly progressive neurological deficit decompressive surgery is very very common is there a literature to say that whether you know this can be a sole procedure it is a useful procedure in the primary care center and uh, vertebroplasty in these patients helps but the problem with this is it cannot come you know shrink the tumor it cannot give the stabilization rather we might you know destabilize the spine but less complicated which is uniformly universally it can be utilized it reduces the recurrence no but immediate neurological compromise can be taken away with these patients so there is you know there are some articles which if you see things which are you know, articles before 2006 there are significant articles available you know where they have done only laminectomy with reasonable success but many of them you know had a recurrence and destabilization that's why it is given up but in the periphery it can be still useful so here is a case of one of our patients you know a patient who came a primary gravida came to us at 36 weeks of pregnancy she came with a severe mid back pain with rapidly progressing flaccid paraparesis of 3 days duration and in this case what did we do first we had a discussion with the neuro and obstetric team or and the family was counsel and luckily we did in our team uh, for obstetrician helped us to do the cesarean section immediately on the same day we did after the under the same ga when she underwent a cesarean we did a angiography and embolization and on the day 2 we did dna and laminectomy and vertebroplasty and the embolization you know we did in such a way that only one radical artery was supplying it and we could do 
a PVC particles were injected and we reduced the significant amount of the uh, uh, hemangioma and we went ahead and did bipedicular cementing injection. And luckily this patient, now this is uh, just about uh, uh, less than a year. You can see even the child is walking and the patient is also walking and it gives the great stability to this patient at the same time, she's completely relieved of her placid paraparesis. So let us look into when to do fusion in these patients. The role of the fusion comes whenever there is a junction vertebrae involved. There is a, if there is a pathological fracture or hemangioma in old age, in addition to the osteoporosis in the adjacent level, in addition to osteoporosis in the same level, if there is a vertebral hemangioma, you can utilize it. And whenever there is a ethanol embolization, there is a risk of pathological fracture, which has to be taken into consideration. So the fusion gives the greatest thing is, it may not give the shrinkage, but gives the stabilization, less complicated. It reduces to certain extent recurrence, but not completely. Success rate is significant. Here is one such patient with a D11 vertebral involvement with a significant you know, epidural extension of the tumor. And in this patient, once again, we did you know, an angiography, but you can clearly see in this patient, you know, to our luck, we could find out it was supplying the Adam Kivix artery, the same radical artery, and we were unable to do the any uh, embolization. This is a very, very important from take home message because each radicular arteries on both the sides should be uh, looked into whenever we put a catheter, super selective catheterization has to be done. And whenever the loop of vessel, which is seen, which is in the center of the spinal canal, which is nothing but adenocubus artery, at that time, you are you're not supposed to embolize these patients. And this patient, we did the uh, decompression and stabilization because of the junctional level and patient is back on her feet after her paraparesis. So the intralesional spondylectomy versus the total embolectomy. So both gives a good relief in these patients. And most of these patients, and especially when you use the adjust, you know, adjuvant radiotherapy, intralesional spondylectomy gives same result as the patients with the end block spondylectomy. Whenever we are doing the end block spondylectomy for the vertebral hemangioma, three things are necessary. One is expertise of the team. Second, surgeon's confidence. Fourth, he should be doing the same procedure to other procedures, which like you know, cardomas or a metastasis. And the, in addition, it requires uh, the allograft implants and the fusion rates has to be perfect in his hand. So the everywhere, we cannot do the total embolectomy in every institution. It requires the uh, significant learning curve. And hence, you know, comparing to the intralesional spondylectomy, the you know, results are almost same. So both of them give, uh, good thing is it causes a shrinkage of the tumor, reduces the recurrence and success rate. And main thing is with the you know, intralesional spondylectomy, it's less complicated compared to total end block spondylectomy. There are good number of papers which are available. The Goldstein has done a multi-centered cohort study where he has shown the end block spondylectomy versus the posterior decompression surgeries, where they have done 11% of it is end block spondylectomy and 70% were done with the posterior decompression alone. And what is their conclusion is intralesional resection plus radiotherapy has a great good local control. End blocks resection not needed even in any can S3 is the conclusion. So if you look at all these things, whenever you add the adjuvant treatment like embolization and radiotherapy, intralesional you know, uh, spondylect uh, removal of the tumor and additional therapy gives same result as end block spondylectomy. So in conclusion, intralesional deep bulking plus RT is as good as total end block in, uh, spondylectomy. Coming to ethanol injection, the mechanism is devascularization, shrinkage of the tissue and healing by sclerosis. So what does it do? It de definitely re releases a shrinkage. Stability doesn't give, this is the main thing, problem with the ethanol. Rather it produces pathological fracture, very well known. And it is, you know, plus or minus complicated because sometimes the alcohol, you cannot visualize where it is going because it's completely liquefied. Sometimes it goes and uh, creates 
uh, significant changes in the parasympathetic and sympathetic fluxes, which is around the vertebrae, especially the celiac components and the epigastric components. And it can even migrate up, causing the local and systemic autoimmune reaction. And it doesn't reduce recurrence and success rates need to be looked in, but it always needs a fusion in these patients. So it, the risk has to be weighed against the benefit whenever you are doing the ethanol injection. So if you look at the literature, the single most article which is coming from India, uh, our colleague Sharad Chandra has done 33 cases, but in every case he has added you know, short fusion into that you know, and also has mentioned one patient had a transient paraparesis. And if you look at the other you know, authors, all develop the transient hypotension and bradycardia. And the safety of which, unless the anesthetic team and the surgeon is confident, sometimes the alcohol injection can create more problem. And it is also well known that whenever you inject more than 15 ml of the alcohol into the vertebrae, it causes more problem than less than that. And if you had to always, you know, in one vertebrae, you cannot give more than 15 ml. So radiotherapy alone, you know, it is whether it can be given as a treatment. But, you know, the problem with the radiotherapy is it requires several weeks to take out the epidural tissue shrinkage. So you cannot wait whenever there's acute deficit and deficit might become irreversible when we use only radiation as a treatment. And also the problem with the radiation is it may not, you know, unless the whole target area is very well covered. And if you're done as an acute phase, we may not have a complete shrinkage but it will also can cause destabilization and isolated. It should not be done post-surgery. It can be used as a single therapy. There are different methods are used. In the past, the cobalt treatment were given. In the present, we have SRS as well as the cyber knife and the gamma knife therapies that are utilized in multiple center. It is a good option for the mild deficit patients when they're coming only with the radiculopathy without the significant collapse of the thing. And it is a definitely a good therapy for preventing the post-op relapse of these patients. And it gives very good relief of the pain if there's a radicular artery. And it is a good adjuvant treatment than a solo therapy. So, you know, in acute phase, better not to be utilized. Coming to the role of the stereotactic RT, as I mentioned, the radio surgery, you know, the problem is the same. You know, it is, uh, uh, the stabilization is a problem but whether it can be used as a sole therapy in acute uh, neurological involvement is a problem. And also the problem with previous cobalt therapy and uh, SRS therapies, you know, there is significant amount of myelitis happens in these patients and radio surgery, when, you know, the present literature, if you look in, the number of cases studies are very, very less in the literature and it definitely requires a randomized prospective control studies of the multicentric because in a single center, you may not be having a significant number of cases and CNS and the NSI combined together. I think in the future, we can look in how these radio surgery will be effective in the vertebral hemangioma. And as of now, it is considered for the adjuvant treatment, but not as a mainstay. So here is one such patients. You know, this is the patient, 41 year old patient of ours who had a thoracic myelopathy in the 2011 and underwent the decompression and laminectomy in outside hospital. In, you know, he came to us last year, 2016, he had a severe back pain. And at that time they had a fusion surgery he underwent. And in 2017, once again, he came back with a parapesis with a bladder involvement where we had to do a revision of the fusion therapy followed by the radiation, so, no, radiation. With this radiation, the whole of the, uh, the epidural component shrank. And as of now, he is doing reasonably good with residual paraparesis, but he's able to manage his day-to-day -day activities. <clears throat> so the trans arterial embolization as a single solo therapy is almost going away, but it is not efficient in cases with a deficit and it always needs a radiation therapy in addition to that, or you can utilize that for, as our case suggested, you can use it for the vertebral, vertebroplasty as well as fusion therapy. And uh, the aggressive vertebral hemangioma preoperative uh, transarterial embolization, whenever feasible, and if you especially uh, the aggressive variety where you see 
the vessels within the comp, you know, epidural space, and if there is an edema within the car uh, that shows that it's highly aggressive with the multiple radicular arteries, in these cases, embolization can be tried as a preoperative method before doing either the end block spondylectomy or the any of the embolizing uh, technique using the PMMA or alcohol therapy. So if you, in conclusion, if you look at that, the posterior decompression alone, you know, will not give the full benefit to the patients, you know, though it is less complicated. And the best treatment available is a posterior decompression with PMMA, with the fusion, which will take care of all five components, that is shrinkage of the tumor, stabilization, it can be taken care, less complicated, reduces the recurrence, and the success rate is very high. Whereas a spondylectomy, you can have the same thing, but unfortunately, it requires the learning curve and it can be done in a tertiary centers where a spine is, and our tumors or other spine tumors are also considered. And uh, ethanol injection, whenever you are doing because of the pathological fracture, it always needs a fusion. And radiotherapy should be used and adjust, as an adjuvant therapy. So the treatment recommendation is the post decompression alone. Only it should be done in a peripheral centers in an emergency case. Spondylectomy, morbid and limited indications, but definitely it is one of the methods. Posterior decompression with the PMMA is the best ideologically you know, suited for every cases you can utilize. Radiotherapy for the local pain you can utilize or a radiculopathy alone, but a good adjuvant post-surgery. Alcohol injection needs extreme precaution whenever you're doing, but definitely it shrinks but needs a post diffusion and embolization is not useful as isolated treatment, needs expertise. And also you should avoid the recurrent arteries, especially Adam Kivik's whenever you're looking into that. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Satish, uh, for uh, giving an ex excellent lecture on management of hemangioma and, and giving a guidelines that which is the best way to treat uh, uh, I know Dr. Muthu Kumar and Dr. B.P. Singh uh, will have questions, but we'll have the questions before the case discussion. Uh, okay. So we'll finish off all the three lectures. Uh, sure. I request Dr. Clemens to uh, invite uh, and introduce Dr. Babu. Yeah, thank you very much. And this was a great overview of uh, some of the you know, more common and vexing problems that affect the bony component of the spinal cord. We're going to take a little bit of a... a you know, change in tack or direction here and go to the intrinsic problems of the spinal cord. And it is my uh, great pleasure and uh, privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Babu Welch, um, a good friend of mine, who uh, is a professor of neurosurgery and uh, radiology in uh, the uh, UT Southwestern in uh, Dallas. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to his lecture, uh, given his long experience with uh, treating these problems um, and uh, coming from the perspective also of being a dual trained endovascular and open neurosurgeon, I'm sure there's some components um, that he will uh, tell us about. So without further ado, uh, thank you very much for being here, Babu, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. You're still on mute. Thanks, Clemens, and good to see everybody again. This has been a good lecture series, um, I think, for everyone. So, and we're, we're taking advantage of the technology. So let me make sure we're seeing the slides here. So, um, yeah, interestingly, as a, as a, as a dual-trained neurosurgeon, I think, I think we got the, the one um, pathology where there's not a lot of endovascular involvement. I, I'd be interested to see what my, our next colleague is going to talk about from the standpoint of spinal fistulae, um, a lot more dual overlap there. But cavernomas of the spinal cord are, are where I'm going to kind of talk about and we're always kind of taught to put our disclosures up here. So just breeze through that. But most of this is related to the endovascular side of my world. Um, the, the cavernomas in the spinal cord obviously are a little bit more of a rare lesion in general. Um, and we will talk about them in terms of some of the epidemiology, natural history, and then really more of the surgical adjuncts and, and it ob obviously controversies are, is the topic. Um, there, in terms of vascular abnormalities, not, not as rare as we think, five to 12% is what I can typically see in the literature. Um, and, but, but interestingly, if you have a spinal cavernoma, 
you know, about a quarter of the patients at most will also have a brain cavernoma. So this is a time where surveillance imaging would be necessary. Um, the the cavernomas of the spine aren't as uh, aren't as insidious as the fistulae. Um, usually, if there's a, a progressive myelopathy, in my experience, we'll usually see cavernomas and diagnose them a little bit sooner to the initial onset than we will with the fistulae. Um, but the pathology is similar in that microhemorrhages and gliosis scarring as a result of those microhemorrhages can have a lot to do um, with the with the way the patients present. Literature will tell you a sensory motor deficit is, is more commonly referred to. I kind of don't like that. It's either a sensory or a motor deficit, but I think we sometimes get rid of the, we don't pay as much attention to some of the pain that's a long-term result. And some of the patients that we've had excellent surgeries and still have some neuropathic pain that we're still treating long-term. There is a, a component of the cavernomas that will present with acute hemorrhages. Um, and that that's, you know, the, again, literature-wise, somewhere between one and five percent of the patients will present that way, and that's a little bit different uh, than that insidious onset. Um, and there is a little bit high. You know, once you hemorrhage once, then your your chances go up pretty high for having additional hemorrhagic um, events. the The take home really from the epidemiology is most patients, as they present in that thirty to forty year range, which is the more common one. Once you start, you're probably going to continue to have some sort of symptomatology over the rest of your lifetime. Um, there's some discrepancies in the literature in my last review that, that they really talk about male versus female. Some series, which are very small, most of the series, largest series I've been able to look at was 53 patients, uh, but most of them are one tier, two there, 10 there, very similar to the hemangiomas. Um, but whether or not it's a female preponderance or a female to male equal, I think can be debated. Um, I, you know, I, I'm just briefly mentioning the familial cavernomas, and, and we have a few clusters that we follow here at UT Southwestern. Um, the, the cases, there's a little bit higher possibility of multiple spinal cavernomas in patients who, are, who have familial disease. Um, 10 to 30 percent is what the literature will tell you. It's a similar, uh, there's really no difference in the chromosomal abnormalities at 3 or 7Q. But the hemorrhagic presentation is probably a little bit more common in those with familial cavernomas. And I don't think the series are large enough to say that's because they have multiple or not, but you can, you can draw the parallel. So the, the imaging is important, um, and I'll get into the presentation and how that relates, but it's still it's not much different than what we're used to seeing in terms of a cavernoma, the typical popcorn lesion with heterogeneous signal on T1 and T2, suggesting hemorrhage usually with the hemosiderin ring. Um, we'll, we'll see that a majority of these spinal cavernomas are intramedullary, but you, there are varying case reports of intramedullary extramedullary intradural, some are actually you know, pushing in or have, have gotten into the dura, those are very rare, um, but the majority of them are intramedullary. The acute presentation affects the imaging somewhat, and these are a couple of images of patients that I've had uh, over the years where you can see this is the same cavernoma um, at different times. Uh, so the, 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 the presentation, the hemorrhage, and then the edema that's associated with the hemorrhage does make it a little bit difficult to, to you know, pinpoint this is a cavernoma. But if you follow them over time, they tend to settle into the more heterogeneous lesions. Some lesions that can be mistaken for cavernomas, I think are important to mention. And of those, the more common hemangioblastoma, spinal metastases, again, the edema associated with an acute presentation of a cavernoma, or is this a met? Um, obviously, the, the staging of the patient's important here, gliomas. Um, again, with the, with the hemosiderin. Uh, but again, outside of the familial cases, the multiple spinal cavernomas are pretty uncommon. So, um, you know, cranial axis imaging, uh, unless the symptoms don't fit, is not typically my routine. Um, when we talk about the indications and timing, I think this is probably where we can, if, there's, if we're going to create a controversy for these lesions, we can probably uh, create it here. Um, the progressive neurological deterioration is, you know, anxiety producing in many patients, especially those, you know, who have lesions that are less accessible. Um, so that, that progressive neurological deterioration is definitely a, a, a lean towards the surgical discussion. 
multiple hemorrhages over time, you know, the literature and my own patients that I've cared for, they typically come in clusters. We've all seen cavernomas in the brain that do the same thing. They'll, you know, hemorrhage, 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 and then they'll have a period of time where they'll, uh, they'll relax a bit. Um, but I think the evidence of multiple hemorrhages over time, which may overlap with that progressive neurologic deterioration, um, would also lean you towards surgery. Uh, a lot of discussion is held in those patients who have acute bleeding with mass effect. If there's a hematoma that's, um, that's really you know, causing deterioration, obviously that's a little bit more lean towards, but really the controversies in the, the, the treatment of spinal cavernomas really comes to where do, you, you know, where do they need to be to treat them and then when, um, you know, I, bor I borrowed this from a friend, uh, just kind of giving you an idea of the, of the various approaches to, and, you know, we put this in the same basket as, as tumors of the spinal cord, but, you know, approaching through a midline myelotomy and the posterior median sulcus, uh, closer to, as you can see in this magnified view, the posterior lateral sulcus, if it's, you know, lateral one way or the other. Obviously, the exophytic lesions are the ones we like to see. Um, that doesn't give you a whole lot of discussion about where to go in. That becomes more of a win discussion. Uh, the lateral ones that don't, that are, that are more, more, a little bit more difficult to discuss are the ones that don't uh, present to the PA that are lateral, not necessarily in a, in a preferred sulcus. Um, and rarely do we have, and are we talking about the more anterior, which is not included on this diagram, but those that are more anterior a lot more difficult to, to get to typically the peel presentation. You're also putting the anterior spinal artery and the vasculature at risk. So, you know, the where and, and when to do any kind of procedure for a, a cavernoma is, is where we'll discuss a little bit. So, you know, the, I, I put controversy here in question mark um, because it, it is a little bit difficult to create one, but we know the location of the lesion, is it, is it fair to say that location of the lesion and the symptoms of presentation will dictate the course of management? I think most of us are there, um, as I showed in the prior slide. You know, a, a peel presentation. This gets into our second, you know, controversy. You know, an asymptomatic lesion, which is exophytic, should that just be excised because it's exophytic, and we know that that younger patient is going to progress? Um, how did they present? Do they have multiple cavernomas in the brain, and we just happen to screen them? Um, symptomatic lesions that are exophytic, I think, are much less controversial. Um, uh, and, and a lot of the times we're, we're waiting for this next bullet, which is the deeper asymptomatic lesion uh, to actually hemorrhage, uh, to produce it, so, you know, to provide a little bit more of a, a decent surgical corridor. But is it controversial to say that these deeper asymptomatic lesions should be watched? I don't, I don't think so, but what is the, what is the radiological follow-up and, and how should we dictate that, especially as I know in the U.S. we're, we're, we're scaling back on a lot of imaging and things like that. How do you really follow these patients and how do you educate them about, you know, when to, when to speak with you in the clinic? So when we talk about those patients that, that are surgical considerations, you know, you know what they're typically an exophytic, multiple hemorrhage, progressive neurologic decline, you know, the we, first thing is really the acute presentation. Is the acute presentation of the patient the time to go and, and treat the patient? Or typically, are we going to wait our two to four to even six weeks before to allow for some of the initial deficit and, and edema to resolve before a surgical trauma is performed? So um, evaluating the surgical corridor is very important. We talked about that in that prior di diagram. The midline lesions are much more accessible, but that, that posterior median sulcus is also very important as you go along the nerve route. And I'll show some examples of that. Um, the width of resection is, is really, really just needs to be as deep, as a, enough to allow for the depth of the approach, but also taking into account a lateral approach. So the more laterally that you need to be, you may get into the facet. This may be a multi-level, uh, you know, facet violation and therefore is stability a concern that should be entertained as we, we go towards these lesions. And I'll comment a little bit on the surgical adjuncts. Um, the, you know, classic surgery for cavernomas is, you know, sharp dissection, bipolar uh, as needed um, to allow for any kind of working around hemocytorin uh, locations. But I found the CO2 laser to be helpful uh, in, on occasion. I personally never dealt with ultrasonic aspiration, but larger lesions, um, it, it is reported in the literature, but typically for, in my practice, the, 
CO2 laser is, is one piece in addition to the um, uh, microscopic microdissection. And then intraoperative monitoring is very important. Um, as we all know, to monitor the progress. Uh, a, a partially resected cavernoma is not a treated cavernoma. And most of the literature will show us that, that the patients who do well um, or do well with a complete resection. So that really is the goal, but how that's tailored by the intraoperative monitoring um, is important. Just a, a, a brief nod towards intraoperative monitoring and this trends, I think it's very common that the somatic injury of both potentials and motor evoke potentials are monitored, that's standard. There's a lot of talk about, uh, about epidural monitoring using uh, D-Wave, and the D-Wave itself is a, is a adjunct to the MEP. So the motor evoke potentials that we usually talk about are transcranial, multi-pulse technique, have the patient stable, send a couple of signals, make sure we've got the motor evokes aren't changing. But there is a decent amount of literature you know, in the out now talking about D-Wave abnormality abnormalities and to allow for it, but give us a better idea about those patients who typically will wake up weaker or with a new deficit, will they recover based on what we've done? Um, that, that D wave is monitored with epidural electrodes above and below the lesion. Um, and then it's a single pulse, a reading. This is an example of the readings uh, from this article by Costa et al. Um, that really looks at that asterisk where you're, this is an example of a patient who had a, a smaller D wave, um, did lose motor evoke potentials, but did not, but had an improvement in the D wave uh, post and that in a patient like this actually get better a lot faster. Um, one comment on that is just, you know, now you have epidural electrodes that you're putting in, is it worth the change in exposure to get this? I think a lot of it would depend on how the patient presents and we'll, and we'll talk about the patient presentation and how much it affects the outcomes. So a couple of just examples here, just talking and I'll, and I'll kind of walk through as you'll see, I've sped some of the video up. But on this first case, this is a gentleman who's a 56 year old male, it's a patient of mine, I've treated his son, uh, both of his sons with cranial cavernomas. And he had surgery for cranial cavernomas at another institution. Uh, and once we treated his sons, he, he, he advised me of this uh, spinal cavernoma. This is at the T9 level. And from his son's treatment to uh, not too far, not too long ago, he had three hemorrhages, most over the summer, uh, that produced a more of a lateral exophytic component to the cavernoma. And as a result of his three hemorrhages, which produced some right lower extremity sensation loss and dorsiflexion loss, uh, he did have he did have some a thoracic level that fluctuated, but in general he tended to recover after each hemorrhage to his baseline. Um, we talked we we took we discussed going to surgery with him. Sorry. So working through this one, uh, as you can see, that exophytic he had a T nine lesion. So what we did was a, a T eight to 10 laminectomy, you can see here, it's just immobilizing the dorsal vein. A lot of the discussion here, you can very clearly see the blue uh, presentation of the cavernoma, um, but we know from the imaging that there was a more leftward approach to this. The, the camera is upside down, I'm left-handed. So just so you can see, this is the left side, that's the right side. As we move forward, you see the, we're just opening the arachnoid here, we're mobilizing the dorsal vein. Um, because the more we move that vein, the more that I can really see the some hemosiderin and also this thinning um, where a better surgical corridor, I think, was uh, could be achieved. A couple of technical points here, um, the use of cotton, you'll see a couple of pieces here. Uh, we use cotton wisps. This is a, a round knife that I like to, I like to use that uh, we got from, uh, from our ophthalmology colleagues. And as we, as we dissect here, what you start to see is not only did you see this kind of blue component here, but there's this exophytic component, which really kind of, that's when you say, okay, that's where we want to be, okay? Um, because we know we're now seeing this lesion where it's presented itself, that it, things are a lot more thin here. Um, and you can see more evidence of the gliosis surrounding hemocytor in there also. So um, that was, you know, mobilized the, a couple of the small arteries here in addition to the dorsal vein. And we're, we're, we're consistently moving leftward. Not a lot of need for any uh, violation of the facets. 
um, but expanding the lateral exposure both through both sharp and just kind of some you know micro forcep exposure. Now we tend to use the hemosiderin to work into the lesion. Um, the, you can see there's hemosiderin around it. The bipolar I usually have set at about eight watts. I don't do, use much more than that. You can I go in saying I'm going to do most of my bipolar within the lesion, um, but you know that's I don't think that's really as fair. Uh, just keeping it low. You know, we tend to work with the diploscope here. So you can see my fellow and myself uh, with, with good retraction uh, ability. A lot of conversation about this is where I'm going. This is where you need to produce, you know, pausing every once in a while to get the motor evoked potentials and know that we, we are not seeing any changes. In this case specifically, uh, right in this area where we started to resect, we had a, um, we had a, a slight decrease in the somatocentric evoked potentials uh, that was related to uh, a slight a drop in blood pressure. One of the comments that I, I think are important is when we're we're preparing for these lesions, this we're, we are potentially creating a spinal cord injury. So keeping these patients with a with a map, usually above seventy uh, to eighty four hours, and, and treating it like a spinal cord injury, that's what I would do. This patient had a slight decrease in that, but as the maps came back up. We saw the um, we saw the uh, SSCPs come back. Um, I didn't didn't do D wave here, and you can just see kind of a tracing here where the motor evokes were very good. A slight decrease in our wave here, but that returned uh, as we got the blood pressure back to where it needed to be, and then resection of the lesion occurred very well here. This is more of an example of you saw I was more dissecting softly, a little bit of bipolar, but the gliosis from the three hemorrhages created a little bit more of a need to. Uh, to actually cut here as opposed to just dissect the way we were doing before. So removing these lesions I think is helpful. Um, this is more of the classic method by doing this with bipolar and, and under the microscope. Just an example of a prior case where we actually, um, just an example of, of using the CO2 laser. The CO2 laser itself is helpful in that um, it's, it's, the bipolars aren't as big, you know, it's not as big as a bipolar. And you can see here, this is, you're, we're just taking the small vasculature um, and then entering into, this is, you can see the cavernoma there. So not a lot of thermal injury to the other parts of the spinal cord. Um, and it allows you to have more of a dissector, still using your fourth hand there. Um, but that CO2 laser, when you can use it, is helpful. It doesn't help with larger vessels. If you've got larger blebs and things like that, it doesn't do as well because you, you're challenged with the energy that you have to give to it and the damage to the spinal cord. But having that available, I think, as an option is, is, a, is a good adjunct. When we talk about the surgical you know, outcomes for patients, it's, this is the, the best meta-analysis I was able to look at uh, and, and, and Ring you really came out of the Helsinki and Tulu Hospital. Um, they looked at their own series uh, back in 10, but they also looked at uh, uh, most of the series up to that point. There were 383 cases that they reviewed. 62% of the patients improved. 9% of the patients had permanent worsening, and they looked at them almost close to three years. Every series you look at in our personal experience here is that the patient presents you know, the, the outcome is predicted by the presentation. So a prior hemorrhage or a severe deficit, they typically won't do it well now as well. If you have a prior hemorrhage and a, and a, and a hematoma cavity that's addressed acutely, that may make a little bit of a difference. The intramedullary location, as I mentioned, is a majority of these um, is, you know, can be associated, but I would say intramedullary and prior hemorrhage or and deficit. Um, and did the, how did the patient progress? It, was it a slow progression, you know, over over a, you know, over a short over a shorter period of time? Okay, better. You know, a rapid neurological deterioration. Typically, that those patients were seventy percent more likely to have a a less outcome with surgery um, versus those that uh, did not have a rapid neurological deterioration. Um, most of the time, we'll see that any kind of radicular pain component will improve better than the motor deficits. And, and there's not, uh, I think, as our, as our prior presenters discussed, you know, these are small lesions, multiple small case series. You know, a majority of them, because they present in the uh, thoracic spinal cord and not as much in the lumbar or the, or the cauda, you know, discussion about bladder function recovery is not as robust in the series as, um, as other spinal cord injuries and uh, column just difficulties. So 
um, when we talk about the, the the carinomas, I think you know it's 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 a little bit difficult to create a controversy, but I think uh, we you know monitoring of the patient it, not in the surgery, right? But how you know are we deciding to take these patients to surgery just because uh, they have lesions? You know um, the exophytic young patient with uh, with an, it was an easy access. They're probably going to get worse over time. It's probably worth taking them. I don't think there's much controversy there. The deeper lesions, again, causing it, you know, a deeper lesion in a patient who's asymptomatic, they need to be educated more about, about these are the deficits we're looking for. And, and then serial monitoring over a large number of years using MRI, I think is appropriate. Um, the favorable, you know, presentation in a young patient with a manageable deficit, we should talk about the discussion, but it really needs to be a good anatomical um, a corridor to, to actually work through. Um, and, and then really, these aren't lesions, as I think our prior presenter also mentioned, these aren't lesions that you want to just take care of and then, and then send them someplace else if something happens. Usually, surgical monitoring needs to be there, good microscopic technique, a good team. Laser's important to have. I think it's a, it's a good adjunct and it's nice to have in those patients. You, you saw the difference in the dissection that you get when you're working with a laser versus bipolar and scissors. So, um, I think you know not not having these just done in in, uh, in the community centers is also important. So I want to thank everybody for the uh, opportunity to speak with you about these lesions, and I'm I'm looking forward to to seeing the discussion about uh, about this finally be fistulas. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you, you Dr. Babu, and uh, uh, we still have the dis uh, discussion at the end. And I request now Dr. Rajkumar Deshpande, to, uh, who is the chairman of uh, Department of Neurosurgery at Fortis Hospital, Bangalore. And he'll be speaking on uh, controversies in management of spinal vascular malformations. Uh, can you please share your screen, Dr. Rajkumar? I hope it's uh, seen Manas. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manus, uh, Dr. Singh, Dr. Muthu, and the NSI and the CNS for this opportunity. I think it's a nice uh, thing to discuss about spinal AVMs after the good discussion from Satish and Dr. Babu. So let's uh, discuss uh, and delve into it straight away. These are rare lesions. Just give me a moment, please. Sorry about that. These are uh, rare lesions. Uh, these are approximately five to nine percent of all vascular malformations of the CNS, or about three to four percent of intradural spinal lesions. Obviously, compared to the cranial AVMs, the clinical impact is often worse, basically because the size of the spinal cord is much smaller, and spinal cords are generally less uh, tenable as far as the impact is concerned. So you can broadly divide into arteriovenous fistulas and arteriovenous malformations. We call them AVFs or AVMs. Now, aneurysms are very rare, and most of them come to attention or concomitant to a spinal AVM. And actually, if you see an aneurysm by any chance in a, in a patient who has a sp uh, MRI, and then you should actually look for an AVM, which is somewhere else. Obviously, majority of the uh, AV fistulas are dural AV fistulas. So this was known for many, many decades uh, and actually came into prominence once MRI became uh, a common uh, investigation tool. Now, in a controversial subject like uh, spinal vascular malformation, if you establish a treatment plan, is a very difficult thing to do because there are not many cases for, uh, uh, in many institutions, uh, the case reportages are very rare. Therefore, we have to learn to do certain things. One is to identify the type, estimate the clinical course, study the vascular anatomy of the lesion, and then weigh the risks and benefits of either endovascular or microsurgical treatment. So let's uh, delve into the classification first, because it's very important to understand what kind of lesion it is. 
the standard original classification was the type one to four, where the spinal dural arteriovenous fistulas, the DAVFs, were either type one or type four. It's very important to remember the type one or the type four. The actual AVMs are type two or type three. Type three being the metameric or the journal AVMs where it involves the tissue, a neural tissue, dura, bone, muscle, skin, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll show some examples of it as we go by. The ones which are actually within the spinal cord, the intramedullary AVMs or the globums AVMs are the type two. Type one is a spinal dural AV fistula, which is actually located in a dural sleeve of the spinal root. And then you have a single coil vessel which goes to the dorsal pile surface of the spinal cord, which was the most common uh, type of DAVFs that was seen very much earlier. And then you have the perimedullary AVS, which are either in front or the back, typically more in ventrally, and they were classified into subtypes A, B, and C. Then uh, we have the special classification of 2002, where all the vascular malformations were divided into human geoblastomas and cavernomas, which I'm not dealing with. The previous speaker, Dr. Babu Wells, did a good job of it and he beautifully presented his surgical skill in excising the cavernoma. And I'm also not talking about spinal cord aneurysms, which are very rare. And this talk is mainly concerned about the AVFs and the AVMs. He classified it into the extradural variety, which was not seen in the first AVM uh, classification, spinal AVM classification, and interdural variety, which fell into the ventral or dorsal type, and the arteriovenous malformations, extradural, interdural type three, which were the uh, I know, Cobb syndrome or the perimedullary type, and the intradural, intermedullary type two, which was in the type two, and a special conus medullaris type. It's very uh, different than what the original classification was. And this was in this particular article, which was there in the surgery. So basically we have the following types, the extradural AV fistulas, the intradural dorsal fistulas, intradural ventral fistulas, the extradural intradural AVMs, intramedullary AVMs of two types, which is compact and diffuse, and the conus medullary AVMs. So I think we have the six varieties and we have to juggle to see which of the AVMs fall into or the AVS fall into this pattern and then discuss what happens to them, what is the natural course, et cetera. So let's understand some basic relevant anatomy. I think most of us know about the anterior spinal artery, the posterior spinal artery, and you know, the artery of Adam Kiewicz, et cetera, et cetera. Most important to understand is all these are coming from the radicular branches. And this is seen in this particular view. I hope you're seeing my arrow here. You can see the radicular arteries, you have the dorsal branch, and you can see once the segmental artery goes inside and divides into the spinal branch, you have the anterior and the posterior radicular arteries, which go and supply the surface, what you call the vas or corona, and the anterior spinal artery is augmented by these arteries. And you can see this beautiful picture, uh, which is from the neurosurgical atlas. It's a beautiful picture. It gives the relevant anatomy beautifully. And in the corners, we have the anterior spinal artery, which forms an arterial basket with the posterior spinal artery at the tip of the spinal cord. So then we have to identify the type. So I'll give some relevant examples here. This is an Excel illustration demonstrating an extradural AVF. And this forms the epidural or the extradural type. The specialist is extradural. And in the older, it was not there. It's called the epidural type. Then the radicular artery, which feeds the venous system at the dural type is the dural AVF type one or the dorsal. Here you find the classical on the root and from the root, it, uh, you have the fistula and then it goes to the dorsal type. Therefore, uh, that's what I said. Normally what happens is the normal venous flow in the coronal venous plexus is diverted to the dura and to the extradural system. When in the spinal dural areas, the arterialized blood flow then go produce this dilated serpiginous vein seen in the spinal cord. So this is a high pressure system, it leads to venous congestion, hypertension, ischemia, and myelopathy. So this is a very beautiful picture, shows the microarteriography of the particular patient with this kind of a disease. Then comes the intradural ventral AVF, 
from the anterior spinal artery and the enlarged venous network. Here, there are three lesions which are classified. Type A are small and have a single feeder. Type B lesions are intermediate. Type C lesions are giant. These are really multi-predicolated, have massively dilated venous channels with extraordinary high flows. So this is the uh, type uh, which I said is a perimedullary or a ventral intradural type. So on the right lower corner, you have this particular classification to make it easy. And here in this particular variety, you can see that anterospinal artery is uh, flowing directly into your fistula and inter interruption at this level is likely to find a cure. The metameric are the ones which are uh, uh, described as COP syndrome. You have this arterial, it's a beautiful picture which shows the whole segment of the vertebra, the osseous bone, the dura, the muscle, the whole uh, area is involved in this particular variety, which we call the extradural intradural. In the intermedullary AVM, we have the compact ones, which is one or two segments. This is a, a, a illustration of the same, whereas the diffuse ones are extensive in multilevel. So these are the multilevel intermedullary types. The conus medullaris AVMs typically exhibit multiple feeders from ASA and PSA and large dilated shunts. And you can see it here at the conus. And uh, this particular uh, conus variety is separate because it has a distinctly different uh, way it presents and the, the cure for this are very difficult to achieve. So the natural history is that there is, uh, you know, uh, there are no established treatment protocols to say that if you do this, these are likely to be the outcome of that. So basically, very much before in the 70s and 80s of last uh, century, we had a large series of patients by Aminoff who uh, had a fantastic uh, series of vascular malformations that had never hemorrhaged. But I think that those are all uh, very uh, distinct subgroups. So the clinical course for this patient generally consists of a progressive neurological decline. And most by the end of six months, they will have some sort of uh, uh, debilitating course. Typically within three years, they'll be largely disabled. And if they don't treat, this decline is really uh, terrible to see. The clinical characteristics of AV fistulas are in the extradural type, which is here in this particular column, you can see that it's due to a venous congestion and spinal cord compression. Whereas in the ventral intradural type is the similar the compression and, uh, and uh, venous congestion. And uh, whereas the dorsal intradural, you have only the venous congestion and rarely hemorrhage. And most of them present with a progressive myelopathy. And the diagnostic modality obviously is MR imaging, which we'll talk about in a while. And these were uh, different nomenclatures earlier. Now coming to the natural history of these spinal AVMs, these are congenital lesions and they are uh, basically high flow and high pressure characteristics results in venous hypertension and hemorrhage. Very often, this is due to a myelomalacia that causes the weakness that happens. Now, hemorrhage is not so common. If it happens, it results in acute onset of uh, either back pain or suboxpital pain with and without loss of consciousness with a sudden deterioration of motor function. So what, how, do we, how do we investigate these patients? Obviously with MRI and MRI being the most common and occasionally with myelography and MRI is not possible and selective arteriography of the spinal vessels. Uh, MRI is obviously the choice. It shows uh, serpiginous vascular flow voids in both uh, T1 and T2 weighted sequences. The T2 weighted sequences show cord edema, myelomalacia, infarction, or hemorrhage. And then uh, hemocytin deposits possibly indicate remote hemorrhage. And the MRI also tells us which location of the spinal cord is involved, where is the nidus, and there are single or multiple lesions. For example, this particular patient which we had shows, uh, which this was from neurosurgical class, I'm sorry, 
shows a patient who had this kind of a flowoid in the T2-weighted sequence, which is seen beautifully at the higher level. And if you do the, uh, see the arteriogram, you can see this uh, feeder into the AVM stayed away there. This is another patient which had a large uh, conus lesion, had a, a low, low angiogram which shows the AVM. Now, a myelogram is done where MRI is contraindicated. That's because of various reasons. Injection of contrast into subarachnoid space. The myelogram is a very old uh, technique. We had started our neurosurgical training with myelogram. Uh, and I think, you know, people who are uh, not into the uh, myelographic area era will not know much about myelogram. It shows uh, filling defects, serpentine filling defects, and a positive test in myelogram indicates the need for an angiogram. This is the gold standard, selective spinal arteriography. And you know, it, it's very critical because it shows the type of masculine malformation, the spinal level, the configuration of the fistula and the nidus, and identification of feeding vessels. Now, is there a real controversy in the management? Yes, controversies exist. Basically because no center has uh, on an average large number of patients to determine. Few centers have it and they are the ones who guide us in towards whether it is towards microsurgery or is it an endovascular treatment. Uh, so few centers have reported large series of cases. The preferences vary based on the center. Now, clearly some indications for microsurgery or catheterization of the arterial uh, feeder is when it is impossible, you, you prefer microsurgery. You do uh, uh, microsurgery when endovascular management has failed or when the endovascular management has been done and then recanalization has happened. And when there is a type one intradural ventral DVF, where there is a single feeder like I showed in one of the pictures earlier, at the endovascular therapy might put the anterior spinal artery at risk and therefore surgery in such patients is preferable. So for a type one AV fistula, I think surgery is preferable because a simple clip ligation or an excision of coagulation of the connection between the artery and the vein will just cure the patient. Uh, in patients who have the uh, fistula related to Adam Kivik's artery, intravascular methods might sometimes put the artery itself under risk. In such patients, surgery may be preferable. And of course, if the fistula is dorsal, surgically it's more amenable than when it by endovascular approach. So let's see some of the series that have been in the literature. This particular series from Mayo Clinic had 92 patients. They had a microsurgical treatment which achieved complete obliteration in 95% of the cases. And this was a type one fistula, which is obviously a very good fistula to be approached by surgery. Uh, in this Stanford series, uh, they collated patients from many centers, 976 patients, a huge number. They were trying to see what are the outcomes and trends in management that they were trying to see whether the costs were increased. What's important to understand is patients who underwent open surgery had a greater cure rate. However, those patients uh, also had a greater complication rate. That could be because the complexity of spinal AVM pathology in surgical patients might have been far more than in the endovascular variety. So that's another paper. This, of course, is one of the best papers uh, of uh, spinal AVFs and AVMs, neurosurgical focus by specialist group from Barrow. In this particular uh, patient's preoperative embolization was used in 40 plus percent of patients, about 20% uh, in fistulas and 56% in AVM, AVM groups. Pure embolization was used only in about 12 odd percent of patients. 90 patients presented with a neurological deficit and about a quarter of percentage, 25% of them showed improvement after surgery. Now, important to realize is they use what is called as a pile resection technique where you occlude the AVM at the border of the AVM at the surface of the cord 
and actually you do not follow the NIDA synthesis spinal cord parenchyma. The aim is to uh, try to obliterate the lesion from the feeders, but not in, go into the spinal cord. For example, it's better to avoid the uh, dissection to the spinal cord to avoid the damage. Now, what happens is if you want to follow the nidus into the uh, spinal cord, they say that it is better if you follow the hematoma or a syrinx. Otherwise, try to do the pile dissection technique. They have extensive experience and they're beautiful photographs of showing a cervical spinal avium where they used intraoperative arteriography ICG and the flow 800 image we showed different nidus formations, how this uh, removed the AVM only by using the pile dissection technique. Now, actually the pile dissection technique was popularized uh, by Spersler after the first paper that came out from Miyasaka et al, where they performed it in 17 cases with a very good obliteration rate. This uh, uh, group uh, from 2020, this is one of the latest uh, general uh, neurosurgery spine articles, which uh, discusses the microsurgical versus endovascular treatment of epidural AVFs. Uh, this I think I discussed. Now let's go to endovascular uh, treatment. The goal is the obliteration of the fistula in AVF or nidus in AVF. The important consideration is to understand the artery of Adam Kiwis, which is between T8 and T12. This is a hairpin band seen in this cadaveric specimen. Now, the goal of embolization is to penetrate a column of NBCA to the proximal portion of the draining vein and not go to the distal vein. If you go to the distal vein, it's likely that it's the over penetration, it could cause venous congestion. Therefore, the location of where you actually put the NBCA is very important. Now, the materials used generally are PVAs, microspheres, liquid adhesives, that is like NBCA, onyx, and a variety of coils. Now, extradural arteriovenous fistula can often be treated by endovascular procedure. And this is a transarterial approach, but occasionally a transvenous approach can be used. So this is uh, what is as epidural. This is an example that I could get from the literature. The microcatheter is within the fistula feeder, is right L1 injection. And you know, with NBCN coils have been put and the fistula is cured. In the intradural dorsal area fistula, which typically uh, is beautifully done by a surgery, it can also be done with a uh, uh, with a you know endovascular technique, but I think uh, the majority of literature says that it is better done with a surgery. So this particular patient actually is a chance patient that came to our hospital who has been treated for a myelitis for many many uh, months, and then he came with a progressive walking difficulty. He is currently paraplegic. And uh, our radiologist on leaving the MRI outside noticed some few flow voids here, which was thought to be in uh, just artifacts in the previous uh, report. But you know, we went ahead with a spinal angiogram and it showed a definite serpiginous appearance here. And then we treated that patient with, a, you know, with the microcatheter in place and we blocked the vessels. And this patient had a marginal improvement in neurological status initially. And then at the end of one year, the cord atrophy had actually reduced. So the edema had reduced, uh, there was no enhancement and the patient had improved significantly. Regarding the ventral arteriovenous fistula, we told, we discussed that there are three varieties, A, B, and C. A being the, you know, the smallest and C being the largest with multiple Fistula, the type A is amenable for, uh, for either surgery or for an endovascular therapy. There are some examples here. In the external intradural uh, metamoric type fistula are very, very uh, difficult to treat. The clinical uh, objective is to just possibly uh, just be palliative in treatment. 
Complete obliteration is very rare. I can show one case. So in this particular case, I will show stage embolization. These are from my colleague, Dr. Sharath, who had a patient uh, who came with subarachnoid hemorrhage, had a CT which showed a fourth ventricular bleed, and you know, evaluation showed a malformation. This was a conus uh, lesion, and the patient had an angiography which showed the avia. And also a patient had a pelvic avia in the uh, pelvic cavity, as well as in the gluteal region. So this was the spinal avium and a pelvic avium with a, what we call as a metameric or a cop syndrome. And uh, he went ahead and uh, treated it with uh, uh, microinjection and glue. It required a, a second sitting. And then, uh, you know, the final cast is seen. And the patient actually did very well. These are the pre-op and post-op embolization uh, MRIs. And the patient did really, really well. He had no neurological deficits. I think uh, it has to be observed over time and see what happens. The intermedullary arteriovenous uh, malformations, the classical type two, are typically treated with uh, endovascular uh, methods. This is the patient with a, a, a localized method. Uh, and in some patients, you know, surgical uh, resection is uh, for very, very small located, uh, highly localized uh, of this type can be uh, excised. Conus uh, medullaris AVMs are uh, a big challenge. Uh, uh, so Specialists and colleagues have the largest experience. They are treated with surgery and embolization. Uh, these are some of the examples. So we monitor uh, during surgery as well as endovascular therapy, SACP and MEP. This was nicely uh, presented by the previous speaker, Dr. Babu, about uh, monitoring, so I won't delve into it too much. It's important to understand you can do some provocative testing uh, and that can be utilized during surgery as well. Corticosteroids are used for spinal cord avians. They're not useful in AVFs. And then of course, in all these patients, we need to do follow-ups. Complications in endovascular therapy include, uh, you know, there's a direct consequence of embolization technique, is secondary to failure to obliterate the lesion and probably due to decanalization. So infarct can happen. Uh, it can be a fundamentally, you know, incomplete uh, treatment. Uh, it can be very difficult to treat because they can be extensive. Uh, and as I discussed earlier, a distal occlusion of the venous drainage system can result in uh, venous hypertension and consequences because of that. So institutions that favor embolization as treatment of choice say that, you know, it's less invasive. You can do uh, multiple embolizations. You can perform embolization in the first sitting itself, early rehabilitation. And then of course, if the embolization fails, there is surgery, et cetera, et cetera. So both surgery and endovascular therapy appear to be acceptable approaches. Some recent literature supported a move towards endovascular therapy, whereas the surgery is being reserved for refractory cases. So these are articles uh, from Howard, which uh, you know basically reviews the 101 extradural AVFs and they found that 32% ended up with surgery, 68% endovascular, and you know the rates of um, uh, you know embolization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Basically suggesting that uh, uh, there is a move towards endovascular or uh, uh, rather than surgery. Then uh, regarding the type four arteriovenous fistulae, the these are uh, you know type. Uh, the kind of type four C lesions, which re really require endovascular therapy. And in these particular patients, I think surgery should not be attempted. These are the latest articles that we have seen from uh, August of 2020 from Watana Bay's team. Now they have discussed a microsurgical or endovascular strategy for spinal AVFs. In their particular group, 35 cases, 10 years, they had surgery in 17 cases. 
They tried to use endovascular surgery as the first choice and whenever it's safe. Microscopic direct surgery was considered for cases in which endovascular access was challenging and combined surgery in five cases. And if you see the results in the flow chart, 80% success in microsurgery, 90% in, uh, in uh, endovascular, 80%. So basically they had a very good cure rate in all these cases. And there's a lot of series available. I just put up a series which had more than 50 cases. And I don't know whether this kind of uh, great number of cases are available in many centers. Our own center, we see about one to two spinal AV fistulas in a year. So it really is not a great number as we look into it. So radio surgery as a modality of treatment, I just want to cover. Uh, in 2006, there is one uh, large series uh, where 24 patients with intramedullary AVMs were treated. And then these were uh, followed for with annual MRIs. And they say that the follow-up was good. Uh, there, you know, of eight patients, three displayed complete obliteration. There was no evidence of further hemorrhage, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this was by, uh, the, uh, by uh, Freiburg, uh, sorry, in uh, Freiburg School of Medicine in Chicago. They uh, collated all the group of patients. They conducted a systematic review of English language literature articles. There were eight unique studies comprising only 64 patients. So obviously the number of patients are very small. It's very difficult to say that the kind of therapy that has to be used radio surgery wise, is not recommended uh, as a routine management of in spinal fistulas. So the key points of this literature review is that endovascular series, endovascular surgery should be considered whenever safely possible. Microsurgery appears to be very good for the type one fistulas or in conjunction uh, with, uh, uh, with endovascular surgery. Combined therapy is uh, another option when endovascular surgery has failed. I think uh, with these are the key points that I saw. I think a careful evaluation by neurovascular board with uh, uh, both uh, an endovascular surgeon and a neurosurgeon. I think there is a trend towards nowadays like uh, Dr. Babu Wells where, who are trained in both and they may be a better judge than just one particular uh, specialty. I think interdisciplinary collaboration and then uh, between neurospinal surgeons and endovascular surgeons should be becoming a standard over time. And of course, you require long-term follow-up. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajkumar, for the elaborate uh, discussion on the management of a spinal vascular malformation. Uh, your description was very clear and you could understand many doubts which you had cleared. Uh, before I go off to case discussion, Dr. Muthukumar had a, Dr. Muthukumar and Dr. Singh, if you have any questions to the speakers. Yeah, uh, Manas, can I, I, can, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the, my first question is to Satish. Satish, that was a really wonderful presentation. Thank and, you. Uh, and your first case, mm -hmm. uh, patient with 36 primary gravida, 36 weeks of gestation. Mm -hmm. I think it was very well managed, but it brought back memories of one of the cases which I had earlier encountered several years back. This was also a primary gravida, 30 weeks of gestation. The mm -hmm. scenario was such that she came with severe back pain and uh, her power was normal, upgoing plantas, mild blunting of sensations below D10, sphincters normal, and MRI showed a D7 vertebral hemangioma with uh, extra dural extension, just about 20% of the canal. So it's a very mild neurological deficit, severe pain, second trimester of pregnancy. That's a very therapeutic dilemma, isn't it? How would you manage such a patient? You know, if they come only with the pain, you know, there are two ways uh, you can look in. If there's no neurological deficit, you have to explain the patient that the pregnancy increases the size of the hemangioma. Usually uh, the hormones uh, which is related to the pregnancy when with the peak level, it also increases the vascular components. And that's one of the things which patient has to be told. And also should give the reassurance that unless the, she has the neurological deficit, 
a kind of a pain therapy can be given for time being and once she recovers from once she delivers sometime it can regress if there's only pain if she gets the neurological deficit then we had to go ahead with the things which we have done and then you know either the alcohol therapy is slightly dangerous in these pregnant women so the only option which is available is you know pmma at least you can inject percutaneous injection is also known you know with the presence uh, in the with the present our experience uh, we know that percutaneous vertebroplasty i can do even in a pregnant woman with a small dose if you put it in the only anterior part if she is in such a severe pain which is unbearable uh, not going with anything else i will definitely consider with the dexam not a ga we give the dexam uh, anesthesia dexamethasone uh, then we can do the vertebroplasty in such patients now my question is this patient had a mild neurological deficit signs in mild neurological deficit and there is an extradural component so we were reluctant to proceed with pmma because the extradural component to inject even if there is an extradural component to inject that's a little tricky is indeed so in this yeah, but now it is tricky but you know with the high viscosity cement and if you put the needle far ahead in the vertebral body and make sure you are controlled well sometime and especially if you do open surgery it is very easy you shrink a bit keep watching the posterior wall you will see the perforation in the posterior wall that's what we normally do in open surgery where we do the laminectomy we will shrink the hemangioma first to see at least to the side not in the anterior part you can't see that on the side parallel to the pedicle and then inject and when you keep watching if there is any leak of the soft material you can remove immediately which will definitely will have a enormous good result to the patient but if without laminectomy is definitely dangerous as my second question to you is you talked about uh, ethanol causing pathological fractures correct so i am sure you are aware of the this month's neurosurgery there's a publication from aims Mm-hmm. where they have, there's a, they have reported for a series of 14 patients with the pediatric patients mm-hmm. where they had uh, injected intralesional absolute alcohol with short segment fixation mm-hmm. and to the best of my knowledge i think the median follow up was 3 years mm-hmm. so they didn't have any pathological fractures because they have done a fusion yeah. if you don't do the fusion there will be fracture that's why whenever you use the alcohol especially if you requires a larger amount you know better to fuse if you don't fuse there will be fracture so I, that that's the reason why i wanted to emphasize because that statement that uh, ethanol can cause pathological fracture should be maybe qualified by a, a statement that when you do that you should uh, supplement no, it with uh, always do it i am very scared when i inject it, ethanol anywhere in these lesions it can cause plenty of problems it can Correct. cause really plenty of problems i'm sure we be also has plenty of questions to you before we move on to the next speaker just one uh, excellent presentation satish thank you sir uh, if a patient just has pain mm-hmm. right now what is your threshold of actually treating such a patient without any neurological deficit say so it you know, two things you know if the patient is a professional like me or you who has a pain who wants to get rid of the pain you know the best option nowadays available is a radio surgery if you don't want to do anything so you know if the patient is you know his bearable pain and i'll definitely follow him up and if there is no posterior wall involvement you know and uh, if it's bearable pain definitely you can watch if not you can definitely do pmma okay yeah thank you dr singh uh, so we go for a case presentation dr prem so we have to ask questions to the other two speakers the other people <laughs> the case, the, within the case you can ask because we have uh, half an hour left in two cases okay so fine. the cases are on uh, on cavern noma and uh, can i request uh, dr sachin uh, to present his case uh, uh, sachin you are online yeah 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 sir i am there yeah. so i should present first or dr arun should present first i i can present you can decide you, yeah you i'll present. present i'll present no issue yeah So just a minute, yeah, I'm sharing. Uh, you have a case, then okay.
Is my screen visible? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So good evening. After uh, the brilliant talks, uh, I'm presenting a case uh, of uh, a spinal vascular uh, lesion to be discussed. So this is a 17 year old female who presented to us with back pain in the mid back region for last six months, a spastic paraparesis for last three months, urinary urgency and frequency for last one month, and she's bedridden for last 15 days. There is no history of trauma, no history suggestive of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is quite prevalent uh, in India, so we frequently ask this history, but there is nothing to suggest. On examination, uh, she had a neurological examination. She, uh, her tone is increasing in both lower limbs. The bulk is normal. Power is, uh, she is quite spastic and uh, power is just one by five uh, bilateral lower limbs. Knee jerk and ankle jerks uh, are all three plus. The plantar is upgoing and abdominal reflex is absent in all quadrants. Uh, on sensory examination, there is impairment uh, to all modalities of sensation below D6 level. Local spine examination is unremarkable, no obvious swelling, tenderness or deformity. So we investigated her and this is her MRI. There is a lesion uh, involving the D5 vertebral body with an epidural, ventral epidural compression. On axial uh, MRI, this is the picture. There is a uh, compression from both sides ventrally and the uh, vertebral broad is involved along with the right side pedicle most likely. These are the uh, typical honeycombing appearance involvement of the right side pedicle and the entire vertebral body of the D5. So I would like to ask the panelists to start with Dr. Rudrappa. So what are our treatment options in this case? You have an excellent presentation. So uh, a disclosure that I have used some slides uh, of your presentation. <laughs> Very good. No problem. You have put a disclosure. You know, good. Yeah. See, I, I think, you know, she's, uh, uh, she has only pain. She has this neurological deficit also. She right? has a neurological deficit. Yeah. So when she has neurological deficit, 17 year old at D6 level, and I would love to do a small laminectomy, shrink whatever it is uh, possible from my side, and then inject the PMMA without a fusion. Okay. So uh, do you think that uh, just injecting PMMA uh, and without doing a decompression ventrally because the compression is predominantly ventral epidural rather than from the back. Correct. So will it help in recovery of her neurological deficit? Definitely yes, because you know it is very well known, as I told you, with the exothermic reaction, uh, the cement, even if you do not completely fill it, uh, the amount of the blood supply which comes from the uh, the uh, periosteum of the vertebral body and from the lateral dorsal uh, recurrent arteries will get clogged uh, because it has to come to the middle of the body metaphysis and then it turns down and supplies the uh, whole vertebrae. So all these things will get burnt because of the exothermic reaction and also some of the filling of the uh, cement. It definitely the whole of the uh, tissue which is seen in epidural uh, space if you do the scan at the end of three months, it'll be gone. Okay. So, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Babu, do you have any uh, opinion on this or you will, uh, you will agree with this management plan or you defer? You have to unmute Dr. Babu. Yeah, I'll figure that out one of these days, huh? So, um, yeah, I tend to agree with that. I mean, you could you could always, you know, with the neurologic deficit, the the decompression is is a main issue here. So, um, but I, I can't say I would do anything different there. Can I have the CT scan projected? Yeah, yeah, keep it that. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Muthu Kumar, uh, I'm sure the what Satish said is certainly one option, but then I. I would prefer a short segment fixation in addition to what Satish said, because 
this patient is almost 17 years old she is unlikely to have any big growth spurts so unlikely to have anything like a crankshaft phenomenon etc i would be more comfortable combining what satish said with the short segment fixation Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to, I guess, ask that question. What do you guys think? I mean, if you look at just the height of this retrieval body, um, is that in itself already representing a fracture? Uh, and would that support what Dr. Muthukumar was just saying, that it needs to be supported going forward? The reason why probably Satish, if, if I may uh, intervene, if probably Satish wants to do only PMMA, is that PMMA probably itself provides some support but uh, it might be better because she's a very active young uh, uh, individual with a long lifespan ahead of her. So I think it might be preferable to do a supplementary short segment fixation. Yeah, in, in, in the this, in this scan, uh, it's not only the anterior segment involved because you have involved involvement of the spine, of the pedicle. So uh, just doing a step PMMA in the vertebral, whether it is enough stabilization. Uh, so, I'll agree with Dr. Muthukumar that the short segment stabilization will be better in this case rather than just doing a PMM. I completely disagree. Um, I think, I mean, okay. we, you, you <laughs> bought a stability from that. I, as opposed to your you justify, no, I, I disagree. Yeah, the thing is, you know, uh, the, the beauty of uh, the vertebral hemangium, especially like this, is, you know, uh, you can fill the cement. Uh, closer to six to eight cc when you know and complete height can be because there it is like a pillar if you see the the pillars within the laminar pattern is very well preserved in this patient and it fills every part of it and it is in the mid thoracic level there's a rib to hold it and you're just doing a decompression only posteriorly so with that you know if it's not junctional in a junctional sure it is required if it's not junctional you know, even the literature says that, you know, it gives a very good result because it's unlike in the vertebral fracture of the osteoporosis where you cannot lift, you know, you have to use the balloon or something to lift it and create the vacuum and then fill the cement. Here, it, you know, eventually goes, passes through every corner uh, Dr. Satish, uh, the conventional uh, teaching is that if the posterior vertebral uh, line is disrupted, then the cement uh, augmentation by vertebroplasty is, can be dangerous. So obviously you told us that with a high viscosity cement, it may be avoided, but uh, for the uh, people, actually uh, not many people manages this uh, quite frequently. So for the newcomers or the young neurosurgeons, do you have a word of caution in such cases? Or yeah. You know, uh, the word of caution is whenever you do the decompression, please use the microscope, number one. Number two, slowly coagulate the whole, the epidural space with continuous irrigation um, or if they now, the present day bipolars, which are nonstick technique, slow compressing, you know, uh, electrical current usually shrinks it very well and it almost becomes a parchment membrane-like, and you will start seeing the sous in the posterior wall, that where there's a broken part, where the vessel is coming out, the hemangio component coming out, you can clearly see. And then inject the cement. So decompression first, second is the shrinking, see the posterior wall on either side, and then under microscopic vision, you know, you inject the cement. Then you will see if the cement coming out, when it's soft, you can easily take it out, and, or you can flatten it so that there will be a layer between the dura and the posterior wall, which will definitely protect it. But you, you have to use it under the microscope. Don't do macroscopic because, you know, and uh, keep watching the cement, how much it comes out, because once it's solidified, it is impossible to take it out and it will come like a small blebs rather and it will be very solid. You have to drill it, which is not possible when there is a significant leak. So when you inject the cement, inject under microscope. What approach will you take, Satish? I do, you know, regular uh, uh, standard transpedicular approach. And I do, I make uh, the path in the pedicle only after shrinking because otherwise it will start bleeding. So you had to first decompress, shrink as much as possible, 
and the bleeding will be quite significant when you in, you know uh, enter into the pedicle so and enter as anterior as possible so your your uh, this will be an open surgery or am i open surgery? surgery it is an open surgery so, so why wouldn't you why wouldn't you begin with the pedicle injection and then go open you could probably decrease the bleeding in a yeah, correct. You know, we can do that provided the posterior wall is not breached much. I guess if the posterior I... wall is breached, then you have to decompress it well and you have to keep watching that posterior wall. Otherwise, the cement leaks, taking it out is very difficult. Patient yeah. rapidly worsened. By the time you do the cementing to the laminectomy, if you see, for example, the patient which he has put in, even in the lamina, there is you know, a hemangioma component. It bleeds a lot. Mm -hmm. And you will not have a time to take out the cement. By the time you enter the cement, it would have solidified in the epidural space, which is dangerous. Yeah, so, you need a hybrid, one a use of a hybrid room, you know, where you've got you, you've got all the angel equipment there. You've got your you, you've got your good fluoroscopy that you can see, but the patient's already positioned and ready for you know for the decompression, et cetera. But I just it, it might it might help with the bleeding. I, I agree, it's going to bleed a lot, <laughs> so it might help with the bleeding if you actually have. You know, you already have your choke car there. So, but I, I have a technical question, uh, Satish. Uh, okay. I'm intrigued by this. How do you do this? Like, you have one person inject and look at the fluoro screen, and then you have another person look through the microscope at the same time. Or uh, can you walk me through this a little bit? I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm curious. So, what, what I do is, you know, I keep the table as low as possible after the decompression. So, I have a biplanar imaging. And I keep it, you know, I use on the single planar in this case, I don't use the biplanar whenever we are injecting the cement. And I keep the table so low that the microscope at the higher level, focus it so that this, you know, the stillet which passes through the probe, you know, is still under the view. It will not hamper your vision through the microscope. And I ask my assistant to inject on the opposite side, you know, half, half of the, the total stillet what you use. Then you can use the microscope to watch on the one side and have a focus. As you said perfectly, two people should be doing. One is injecting, one is watching. Mm -hmm. And keep the table completely low. Satish, mm -hmm. any deterioration following PMM injection is not only because of uh, uh, mass effect caused by the bone cement, but also by the exothermic reaction, isn't it? So, Which is a rare. Dura is such a beautiful... Uh, layer you know i have done so many vertebroplasties and uh, i i never seen anybody deteriorating because of the exothermic reaction yeah dr sachin can you okay. tell what was done and then anybody, we go to dr. anybody Sayon. for anybody for alcohol injection obviously given your recent publication you would have injected alcohol only <laughs> so i am i am biased but uh, this is a open forum and an open case so anybody for alcohol injections, you would like to do alcohol, sir? Uh, alcohol, yes, possible, but in very small aliquots, which, uh, I mean, very, very, very small. And then wait and see for any systemic reaction. In alcohol, the problem is systemic reaction, which Satish mentioned, you know. Uh, I had some bad experience early in my career with absolute alcohol. So I be, I can, be, this can be done. Certainly, but in where it should be, one should be much more cautious while using alcohol than PMMP. Anybody would like to do a, maybe a posterolateral decompression to uh, remove this ventrolipidural compression, maybe by an extra cavitary approach or removing the rib or something, uh, in addition to what has been already said that you stabilize, uh, you put cement to decrease the vascularity, but Again, the patient is almost paraplegic and a young patient. So we want her to recover. And the best chance of recovery is by doing a decompression in front of your eyes. So anybody... That is or... the reason why, that is the reason, Sashin, why I asked this particular question about the approach to, uh, to Satish. Because to reach the ventral uh, surface of the... Uh, to reach the ventral dural surface, I think a lateral extra cavity sh should be a good approach. You expose it and then put two screws, one screw above, one screw below, 
and then start the injection, whether it is with exposed the, through a lateral extracardial approach, the anterior um, margin, margin of the dural sac. And then if you start injecting either cement or auxiliary alcohol, then you are reasonably safe. But but in in the plan by Dr. Satish, there is no men, no plan of fixation, so it's just putting a cement and uh, so obviously fixation is not in picture till now. So if we are doing a lacca a lateral extra cavity, probably you we need to fix because we may have to go bilaterally also because it's an uh, compression from both sides. Sachin is not required. Okay. Sachin, can you conclude so that the yeah, 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 yeah. Water is done so that so, was... this, this has been borrowed from uh, Dr. Satish that the aim is again to shrink, stabilize, avoid complication and prevent recurrence. And the various treatment options, uh, obviously, the we have already discussed, Dr. Satish has beautifully described that these endovascular and percutaneous emboli, uh, alcohol and all are not that great. Radiation and cyber knife, again, that can be done if it's uh, just a pain and no neurological deficit and a contained lesion. Uh, cement injection, we already discussed. And block spondylectomy, no, no takers for that. An absolute alcohol and uh, decompression plus minus stabilization and cement are, are two options which have come out of this discussion. So uh, as per Dr. Satish's uh, literature review, this is what uh, is the uh, which provides uh, the best thing. Everything is ticked in this posterior decompression, PMMA, and fusion. Uh, and the clothes second uh, will be maybe a ethanol injection if we are also doing a stabilization. So let's see what we did. Uh, uh, so what we did is actually uh, guided by this our original publication from our center by Dr. Sharath Chandra and uh, absolute alcohol injection, uh, laminectomy and short segment fixation. This initially uh, was as a pilot study was published in neurosurgery in 2011. And what is actually done is uh, uh, one level above and below the lesion, we uh, put screws and then uh, by uh, inserting transpedicularly the Jamshedi needle, we uh, in, uh, inject alcohol in small aliquots of 0.5 ml uh, gradually. Uh, so that uh, instantaneously you can see that the vascularity of the uh, legion is uh, gone. Uh, so initially when you insert the Jamshedi, there is rapid gush of blood, but as you start injecting and around three to five ml on each side, a total around 10 to 15 ml in each uh, uh, vertebral uh, hemangioma, uh, we get a good embolization. And as uh, no, as it is known that uh, absolute alcohol can cause pathological fracture, that is why we are supplementing it with a posterior stabilization along with the posterior lateral intertransverse fusion. So that pathological fracture has been taken care of. Uh, with uh, this alcohol injection, the all the epidural component also shrinks over a period of time. And uh, this has been... Uh, the final picture which happens, you do a laminectomy, so posteriorly you are decompressing, you are stabilizing, you are putting alcohol. And the advantage is, is again, the direct visualization, decompression, instrumented stabilization. So we are relying on one more factor uh, of stabilization so that there is no, uh, no uh, fracture and collapse later on. So it is also very cost effective, at, at least in our setup. In, Uh, that is quite uh, low and uh, then uh, this has been now uh, almost has been long term results are also published in 2018 33 patients a mean fall off of almost four years and all patients improved uh, one patient had a transient neurological deterioration which recovered within two months and he also ultimately recovered and one intra of hypotension so it is not if it is properly done uh, in small aliquots, it is not uh, very dangerous. So we have now almost done uh, 50, 60 of these cases over the last 10 years and the results have been really good. So no fractures, 
no long term neurological deficit and uh, this patient is one of our initial patients see almost 10 years now no recurrence completely recovered and this is her post op picture so what you can see is the ventral epidural compression is gone and there is some sclerosis also in the body uh, after injection so if you compare this pre op with the post op the ventral epidural compression is gone and axial images this is the pre op one and the post op ventrally the it has shrunk we haven't decompressed it it has shrunk on its own following injection then this is the pre op uh, ct which has improved there is a bone density has definitely gone up there is some sclerosis so uh, if we summarize uh, the management of hemangioma obviously this slides is pretty important and everyone should uh, have this uh, on their desk so this uh, pmma posterior decompression fusion is pretty good and uh, what comes a close second or almost equivalent results as per our experience is ethanol injection with stabilization so if we are stabilizing this pathological fracture is tick it's not that complicated we have seen it over the last 10 years now and there has been no recurrence uh, in uh, our our experience initial one case had recurred uh, uh, only one case out of this 50 60 cases had recurred but again when we did did a repeat injection and uh, uh, then she is doing well for last 7 8 years so obviously these two options should be always thought of uh, in case of portable hemangioma and thank you for your kind attention sir you appreciate for the beautiful case and yes yeah dr satish if you wish to add on this is good you know we are already concluded let us not you know we'll go to the next case thanks sir sachin thank you thank and dr arun please sir, can you present your case please yes sir uh my uh, slide is visible yeah yes so i'll go quick uh, uh, as as a surgeon we are dealing uh, mainly with the type 1 uh, avf so i'll go with a uh, few cases and then i'll open the discussion uh, simultaneously so the first case is 48 year old male uh, he was former by occupation he was having background uh, spastic uh, uh, paraparesis then while working in the field he uh, he developed a sudden onset flaccid weakness and then after few days when he recovered we have found that his uh, uh, weakness were uh, in both the lower limb and the weakness were uh, symmetrical and uh, upper motor neuron type of weakness was there and when we have uh, uh, scaled on the aminoff log we have found his gait was uh, severely compromised that was five and his bladder and bowel control was gone so this was his radiology where it was a classically as dr rajkumar has uh, already shown a beautiful uh, radiological picture in t2 weighted images it was showing uh, card edema with lot of vascular uh, uh, channels fluoids and in uh, axial scan you will see a polka dot kind of things in the uh, uh, peri spinal and uh, and the uh, foramenal area so this was the radiological picture and uh, when we did the uh dsa we uh, the the intercostal run was done and we have found uh, this fistulous connection so this is a straight forward case i'll i'll raise the controversy at the end of my talk so this is the first case where this was a, a type 1 spinal dural avf and uh, uh, one more thing i want to add from our our center that most of the time we are getting these cases uh, because of the cost issues as well so this case and then this case uh uh this is a very interesting case where uh, the interventionist has found a feeder from uh, a feeder from the the radicular artery which was supplying the dominant psa so dominant psa from the feeder is one clinical situation where uh, uh, this controversy uh, comes whether we should go for the uh, glue embolization or we should go for the surgery and then then the another situation is the kind of when asa is arising from the getting augmented from the the fistulous feeder so uh, i i would like to uh, bring the these three scenario uh, in front of the panelist and dr babu and dr rajkumar 
that uh, these kind of kind of situation one is straightforward uh, when uh, we have uh, we are open for both uh, surgery as well as uh, endovascular procedure second situation as i shown the dominant psa is getting supply from the reticular artery and uh, third situation where the asa is getting uh, supply and uh, support from the feeder artery it's 9 o'clock Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, first, I would like Just to put... one one person, and they will they will answer. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Dr. Rajkumar, sir. Yeah, I would like to uh, take opinion from Dr. Babu. Uh, he is our uh, guest, Dr. Babu. These are interesting cases, so obviously, I would like to know your opinion. Yeah, I. You know, I, I I enjoyed your talk. Your talk was perfect, um, and I think it kind of addressed the the trends, but you know, plus minus whether or not they're good. Um, yeah, I think we're at a point right now where we have good endovascular and and refined surgical options, and so I think these three cases are are good looks at those. I think a, a point to bring up is you have a lot better understanding of the vascular anatomy in the endovascular side. Right, so if you're really coming close to, um, it, it's very hard to know exactly which vessel you're at, it's a, it, unless you're in a hybrid area or you're you're doing the angiogram, looking and doing the angiogram, looking back and forth. Because the spinal cord a lot of times is is in the way. Um, so for you know for your your, to me, what's the most direct way of getting to the fish? So the first one you showed, I, I agree. I think we get really good results. You know when I when we first started talking about this and publishing it, we were 72, 73%, we would say it was a good chance of being able to do this. And that was well before Onyx and other things. Now, yeah, 90% of the time, more than that, you can take patients in pure endovascular. So if there's an option there, but but if you get to a point where just a little bit of, and I, I will talk in terms of Onyx more than glue. Um, you know, if you're, if you're worried about a little bit of reflux, or you're not sure where it's gonna go, Surgery is a lot faster, um, a lot of times, and the radiation is less. So I think one of the things we have to think about is the is how much radiation. And you know, you you, you sit, sit in a large metropolitan area, and every once in a while you're going to get somebody who the the radiologist who doesn't have any backup tried and tried and tried and tried, and next thing you look up and they've got you know seven thousand, eight thousand milligram of trying, and now you have to make an incision on their back. Um, and, and that doesn't tend to heal very well when you're, when you're trying to have someone. So, you know, typically for me, um, I think, you know, if, if there is, my, my typical rule is if I'm gonna spend, you know, more than an hour getting to the place that I need to embolize, then I probably should have just taken them to surgery anyway. I have a low threshold to take them. And there are times where I've, you know, where there are multiple components and we've taken care of one endovascularly, but, we bring them back the second time with the catheter in, we turn them over, we've got them on their stomach while they're ready for surgery um, and then doing that. So your your first case, I would probably lean towards the endovascular. I think when you're having, um, when you're having, uh, a, a, if you have supply, you know, from, and this is this would be one where you, you might, you might not get exactly where you, you might not be able to push all the way into the vein. Right, and when you have to push all the way, if you don't push all the way into the veins, it's coming back. It's just a matter of time. And so at that one, you you push it. You know, you you give it a shot. If you don't get into the vein, then you bring them back for their follow up with the plan to go ahead and take care of it surgically. That would be the thing. But sometimes you see these very diffuse ones, especially when you see that much flow to the vertebral body. Um, but when you have, you know, I've, I've had a few that it's it is the artery of a Danquist that that is supplying the fistula. Um, and again, I would typically opt for endovascular at that point because I know exactly where I'm going. And those you, you know, I've gone through the artery of Adamkowitz with some vasodilators. So you vasodilate, make sure you don't have spasm, take the catheter through, through all the way to the end. And typically that's there, a lot of them have been more conus lesions. So you go through there and, and you can take that down. The scary part about those though, is all of a sudden the flow in the artery of Adamkowitz goes down. And yeah. so you're, slow flow in the artery and you're worried, oh, what did I just do? But it's going to because it was a fistula before, right? So it's going to slow down. You make sure you watch your pressures, make sure the vasodilators are used and you can get good results from that. But um, I think 
I, I think if I don't want to go too long, I want to give you give you also a chance to comment. But that's kind of my general idea. The other, so that that posterior spinal one, it's not it's not that big an artery. Um, so again, would probably be, yeah, that would probably be surgical um, with with you know with using high you know, using the, the in in, a, in an area where you can either use a biplane or we have a you know, a pheno arm here, which, which you can, you can use to actually move around and see exactly where you're going and be very careful with that, but. Yeah, actually this, this was a dominant PSA and uh, it was arising from the feeder. So actually the first case, which was the straightforward, uh, there was a cost issue though. So we have gone for the surgery and patient did well. Mm -hmm. But in this case, actually it was referred from the interventionist as uh, PSA was arising uh, from the from very close to the feeder. But this case is very interesting as uh, uh, ASA was getting augmented from the feeder, uh, which was supplying the fistula. So mm -hmm. what they have uh, helped us, they have put a micro coil in the radiculomuscular uh, artery so that this can be identified during the surgery. It was uh, very well appreciated during the surgery on fluoro and we were able to achieve a good job. So uh, this is what we have, uh, you know, done in this case, and it was very interesting to note that uh, this has really made the surgery very easy, and localizing this uh, this uh, fistula site was very easy. Uh, so this this case was operated where the augmentation of ASA was uh, there with the uh, from the feeder, but PSA uh, where the PSA was uh, taking supply from the feeder, that was also operated from. Uh, surgical side and patient did very well. His Aminoff log score has also improved drastically. And yeah, we call that leaving breadcrumbs. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's, so and, it, it, at least you can do that. So yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, in this case, uh, actually, uh, when they were uh, preparing for the, you know, embolization, then suddenly they realize key properly they have during the diagnostic uh, DSA, they have left this uh, augmented ASA. So they did the uh, NGO above and below. Then they have found, yeah, actually it was uh, augmenting ASA. So this case further, they have stopped and it was referred to us and ultimately we have operated this case. So as uh, Chandrasekhar sir rightly said that uh, we should be very careful about the type one SDAVF where we should be seeing on few important uh, angiographical detail like uh, whether the ASA is getting uh, you know, augmented from the feeder, PSA is getting augmented from the feeder or not. And last case, this was a case of uh, sacral uh, uh, AVF and this going surgically to this low is actually very difficult. So I would like to ask uh, again the moderator and uh, Raj Rajkumar sir and Babu sir, Dr. Babu that What's your take on this, these kind of low lying fistulous connection, which is actually lying uh, at the level of S3, S4 somewhere, very, very low and, uh, you know, going surgically is really difficult. Right. You want me, you want me to run with that one or do you want to comment yeah, on please that? Please go ahead, Dr. Babu. You have more experience in the vascular. So, I, you know, I, obviously that, when the when the surgical approach becomes more difficult, you're going to lean more towards the endovascular. But it's not that you can't get there. It's just um, I think I would probably have a little bit more of an endovascular route. It's again, it's very very tortuous to get there, and I and it doesn't look like that's that is your microcatheter about as far as it's probably going to go. Um, so you know, if we wanted to really be tricky about this if there was any kind of potential transvenous component to this or a transvenous option we we're, we're doing that a lot more in the in the fistula in the cervical medullary junction in the head spine uh i can't say that i remember doing that but i wonder where that venous drainage is because that looks pretty straight that would be another just thinking outside the box option but i if i had to guess i'm guessing you ended up operating on this too yeah, even uh, we have gone for selective lateral sacral uh, uh, catheterization and ultimately it was embolized and uh, it's all yeah. gone. The yeah. fistula and patient did very well. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that far. these were the cases from uh, my basket. Uh, the only thing I would like to uh, conclude from my side as a, as a you know, with uh, 15, 16 odd cases experiences that 
I I always keep uh, differential diagnosis in differential diagnosis of card edema. Always include uh, SDAVF because sometimes you get confused with the intramedullary tumor and then you go ahead with the biopsy intention and you actually deteriorate the patient. And uh, this what I have learned over last seven eight years that always read the spinal angio with intervention fully because we are good in reading the cranial angiogram, but obviously this reading spinal angiogram is a different ball game. And uh, actually, uh, I, 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 I actually suggest all the young neurosurgeon to not get trapped in the nomenclature. Yeah, you should be knowing all the types, but getting trapped is actually inhibits you to go for the um, surgical options. So just talk to your uh, intervention colleague, understand what you can do as a surgeon in that very case and do it. And always call the interventionist to the OR. Because once uh, interventionist, interventionist is there in the OT, now, he will definitely help you in finding out because these fistulous connection is not like one-to-one -one arteriovenous connection. They are sieve-like. So uh, it's always better to call them and just try to localize the vein which is actually getting, uh, you know, engorged and try to uh, coagulate or cut that vein as close as possible to the fistula. And never hesitate in going for check spinal NGO if you are having any doubt during the surgery, our patient is not improving. Because in one case, we have found that we have actually done the surgery at uh, you know uh, one level above while it was supposed to do a level down. So never hesitate because immediately after the check NGO, we have gone again and uh, we have done the surgery successfully and patient improved uh, significantly. And you, as far as possible, utilize your all the possible gadgets like Doppler, Intraop, ICG, Fluoro, and monitors. So that's what I have learned over the year. And uh, if uh, moderator and uh, uh, Dr. Babu, Dr. Rajkumar would like to add anything uh, to that. Dr. Babu, I'd like to ask, what is your protocol for getting a post-treatment uh, DSA done, spinal angio? Do you do it in all cases at what time? And uh, what about the non-responders? Yeah, I usually kind of as a standard, I do three months out for all of them um, just to make sure that we're seeing everything. Obviously, we follow clinically. Um, essentially, I, I, I spoke about this at a, um, at a national meeting one time and I asked the same question. And I asked the question as, how many of you do long-term follow-ups and in a very small minority in the room actually does, did follow-ups in that. And it was a well-packed meeting. Um, so I, I, I got the impression from that, that maybe that's not the norm that maybe a lot of people were following patients clinically. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think we'd rather catch them before they go back down their route of slow deterioration again. Um, and then, um, you know, for the, for the, I guess a non-responder would be not treated, you know, and, and that that would be, if, if there's recurrence, then we have to kind of look at what our options are at that point. I think to me that AVMs and the fistula are such fluid lesions, you just have to kind of roll with the punches is the way I think about it and understand the anatomy. I agree that it's easy to put these in baskets, um, but uh, it, it's, it's, well, it's actually, it's hard to put them in baskets. I mean, we can, we can, get them close to and lump, but I'm, I'm more of a splitter than a lumper, so, but. Uh, can I have a question to Dr. Babu, please? Hello. Yeah, please. Uh, this is a very basic question, maybe even naive. Uh, how do you select based on your MR, if, you, if MR shows a suspected artery venous shunt, how do you choose which level to catheterize for diagnostic purposes? Because do you just do an aortic run or do you selectively choose the level based on the MR because if you be base it on MR, it is possible that you might miss something above or below, isn't it? Yeah, that, it's, a, it's actually a great question. I, um, and we've kind of evolved here over the years. Um, you know, in the US, uh, this is a very expensive study, right? I mean, if you're going to, because if you're going to do an angiogram, you're basically doing, you know, all the way down to make sure that you don't, that you catch everything. And, and we, Initially, when we would do that, we would do all levels, make sure we saw everything. And you got to the point where, the, you know, the x-ray and the amount of dye you've given, you really couldn't plan on doing an angiogram and a treatment at the same time. So you'd have them, you'd, you'd cool them off, and you bring them back. Now we have pretty specific MRA protocols, so 4D MRA, we call it. So you're, 
where really we can do an MRA and focus. It's a dynamic study. And then based on that dynamic study, we can really limit how much radiation and how much dye. So a guy I have tomorrow actually is someone that, you know, I can now have a conversation with them about, we will come in further. I understand your, your fistula and then we may be able to treat you at the same time um, because of what we've talked about. You know, it's likely to be an endovascular attempt first, right? But now we can diagnose on MRA angiogram to refine and then potentially treat during the same session, which is a little bit safer for the patient. So uh, that's a, na it's a natural question. I think that we've, e we've evolved here. I would say we probably started using the MRA more routinely three, four years ago. So before that, it was a lot of spinal angiograms and we still have a lot of um, uh, transverse myelitis. If someone showed a case on that here, uh, you want to a transverse myelitis being treated. The guy that I'm treating tomorrow was an MS patient that, you know, was being treated for MS. You know, MS in a 46 year old male, you gotta think you might be talking, dealing with something different, right? Um, but he had the cervical course of uh, uh, two years of progression um, before anyone did an angiogram on him. And, and he, it, they did the MRA and found a really good lesion with feeding right at uh, T, I think it was T6. So. I was looking into the literature, Dr. Babu, and I was trying to see if CT angiogram were to make any sense or any difference. There's not much literature on that. Your thoughts on that, please. You know, um, we ha I think we just haven't because you don't get the same spinal cord information. So I think we probably lean more towards the MR because we, we can see edema. We can, we can kind of focus on the level at that point. Um, I think if you knew you know, if that's what you had and you knew where you were going and you just wanted the vascular information, I think that, you know, a three, you know, a 320 slice scan or something that's going to give you a good range to scan over is, is reasonable. Um, I know Clemens is, I don't know what you all's protocols is on, on the, on the management of, of, or the evaluation, but um, I, I, MRA has gotten good enough for us. I think we just use it and we get kind of all in one, all in one fell swoop and they don't, they don't take that long. We, when we first started using them, we were using, we would always do our spinal angiogram to validate it. We would do the MRA that morning and then bring them to spinal to see if we saw the same thing. So, and we were, we were getting pretty good at them. So we just defaulted to that. Yeah. One, yeah, one, uh, one challenge with CTAs is that um, they're difficult to gate um, to pulsation artifacts, which you can do with MRI protocols in the spine, which really makes a huge difference. Um, as you know, you know, a lot of things uh, we look at in the spinal cord and say like, well, that's gotta be a pulsation artifacts, right? There are actually techniques to overcome that, but that doesn't really work for the CTA, just for, you know, the, the way it's done. Right. And I think to, to address the other question I was um, just uh, so I touched upon, I totally agree with Babu. You know, I think um, from the angiographic perspective, it has to be a positive identification of that feeding vessel. If you can't find it at that presumed level um, that the MRI might indicate that it is there, then you got to keep going, right? I mean, we all have seen these textbook examples where you have uh, pathology like venous congestions or, you know, at a given level, but the feeder is somewhere else, like much higher or something like that. And unless you truly find that connection, you have to keep going. And yes, you sometimes have cases where you essentially do a diagnostic study that incorporates the entire spinal vasculature until you find that connection. Mm -hmm. uh, so you gotta be happy basically with that what you found supports the theory of what's going on, right? You can't just walk away from that saying, ah, it's gotta be there, but I can't see it. Uh, that probably is, uh, that. that's not helpful in the end. Yeah, that just means they're getting another somewhere else. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Right. One, yeah. Of the question, one of the cases which Rajkumar showed was a patient who had a cranial SAH who was found to have a, if I remember correctly, a cervical AV fistula. Am I right, Rajkumar? Yeah, I, and we have had the patients like that who come yeah. with subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh -huh. blood in the fourth ventricle, third ventricle, and then, you know, you evaluate, the brain is normal, the patient has, has to have bleed somewhere else. And many times you have said that, you know, it is a cranial angiogram negative patient subarachnoid to be followed up. But actually, if you were to look at the MRI of the whole spine, you will start seeing some flow void somewhere or some T2-weighted change. I think you have to chase it. Chasing is a very important thing. 
I still remember when I was a, a resident some 30 odd years ago, uh, this particular case report by Sethi Rangachari. Uh, I think if seniors will remember this particular case, patient has had multiple subarachnoid hemorrhages, the brain angios were done, it's all normal, CT scans were uh, showing subarachnoid hemorrhage, but he chased the patient and he had an anterior spinal artery aneurysm which was clipped. I mean, that was an eye-opener for us to look at all those patients who were negative angios for the brain, look for the spinal abnormality, and you will be surprised that you will find some patients who have had spinal DAVFs or AVMs. I think it's easy to give up. It's uh, uh, very hard to chase. Yeah. I think one of the main... Uh, the wonderful cases you showed, uh, luckily my center is one of the centers where we do both endovascular, my partner is a very good endovascular surgeon. And uh, whenever we do this kind, both of us participate because in case, if he's too tired with multiple and identification of thing, I take over and with the modern technology of, you know, we you do exactly like a cerebral aneurysm, especially both the AVM and dural fistulas, especially when there is a supplementary, supplementary thing which is happening to antispinal artery. Uh, we use the micro uh, clips first, you know, to see exactly like an aneurysm, how we used to do once upon a time. And even now we do uh, temporary clips and see whether the cord will have anything. And with the use of the intraoperative monitoring and ICG and a micro clips, temporary clips, you know, uh, a lot of things can be taken care. I think it is a, a combination of the intervention uh, surgeon and the uh, uh, neurosurgeon is already in the intervention, makes enormous difference to these patients. Sometimes it is a very tedious finding out these things, but very important in the first shot, you know, make sure you will get the good result. Otherwise, you know, it will become very, very complicated to the patient. In a patient with an intracranial bleed, uh, um, if you do a posterior circulation run, I mean, I'm given to understand that it is possible to miss, miss this cervical AV fistulas, if you inject only one vertebral artery and look for the reflex, and if you are satisfied, there is sufficient reflex in the contralateral vertebral and pica. But in such patients, if you inject on both the vertebrals, it is possible to pick up these cervical dural AV fistulas. Am I right, Dr. Babu? I, I you know, I, historically, the workup of angiographic negative subarachnoid hemorrhage included a cervical MRI for that reason, right? I think, uh, you know, I think we've we, we may we, we hear maybe have fallen off that a little bit, um, but I do make sure that when I'm doing a vertebral injection for those patients that we're seeing a lateral which shows us this, right, and an AP which shows us this. Um, I think if you do bilateral verts that way, then then you, you'll usually catch a cervical medullary lesion that might have given you that subarachnoid hemorrhage. But if you stick to the MRIs, more often than not, you're going to catch it. So so you know we're because we're doing this, I think we've seen more of it, which is why we've gotten away from the MRI. But if you're not doing bilateral verts, at least get an MR that includes a cervical MR, and I think you'll catch it. So. And I think um, the few series that show, you know, that whatever you tack on to your workup for those, you will always find an additional percent or two of problems. Um, so in other words, you know, the first angiogram gets you to you know, something like 85, 90% uh, of uh, conclusive evidence, the next angiogram to maybe 96 or so, the third angiogram to 99, the MRI gets you another percent or so. So I think it's a little bit of a, you know, question of, you know, how far do you want to take this, right? And that's where a little bit of judgment also comes into play. If you have a good alternative explanation, you know, like the patient who has that typical presentation because they were weightlifting or bearing down on the toilet or something like that versus that patient where that doesn't really apply and they have a lot of blood, you know, and they're maybe have some blood that's lower down or something like that. Right. So I think there's a little bit of uh, judgment still involved. Um, we, for that matter, still do the MRI in every patient. You know, we, we feel better that way uh, because it doesn't really detract that much. They're here for several days anyway in the hospital. So you might as well just, you know, add that to the workup. One yes. question for Dr. Babu regarding the spine and cavernomas with, you know, the ones which have met a significant need, what would be your timing for surgery? Would you prefer to wait till the edema settles down or would you want to do them relatively early 
find the hematoma gives you a good name. Hematoma, yeah, <clears throat> right? If I think there's a, if there's a hematoma cavity, I would use it. Um, if there if this is if there's more edema than hematoma, then I probably would give them a good four weeks or so. Would be kind of my lean on that. But if the hema that one like the one I showed at the beginning, that that was a larger hematoma that we could go in and present it. You can at least decompress it, right? Do you need to go in and get the entire cavernoma out? If it's there, sure. But you know, if you're decompressing the hematoma, then you can return for the cavernoma rejection once it's re released a little bit. Then, but edema versus hematoma, it's kind of my ratio in terms of the time. Another question to Dr. Babu is that uh, in a cavernoma patient, which is incidentally discovered, or it is a part of a multiple cavernoma workup, if the mm -hmm. child, if the patient is uh, sort of asymptomatic, will your approach for intervention or threshold for, for intervention be different between a child and an adult? Or will the size make a difference? Uh, you know, I, if, if they're asymptomatic, is the position of it. Right. And I think that's where the controversy really, if we want to create one out of this, that's the one. If, if you've got a, if you've got a deep cavernoma in a child, you just have that that's asymptomatic. You just have to talk to the family and say, you know, we'll, we'll stay in touch. And this is probably going to present a problem long-term, but at least, at least, you know, I'm going to make them worse. Um, if, unless I've got some, you know, perfect midline myelotomy approach to it. Um, but for a, uh, and I would probably take the same. I've got a couple of people now that, that they just didn't like the fact that we were following them and they were asymptomatic and then they went someplace else. It's, I think that's the right thing to do. So, um, but, but really you get to the point, we do this with the intracranial carbonomas too. You get to the point where they're educated enough to come back and you trust them. And then I may let them go for a little bit, but it's usually not, it, it's interesting. It takes them, it takes them three, four years of coming back and forth to kind of understand this numb finger was not my cavernoma right that was because you slept on it right so um but but talking to the talking to the patients through i think is the important thing when when you have an asymptomatic deep cavernoma i think i'm not rushing after it so if the hemorrhage and re-hemorrhage rate is it different between children and adults uh you know i don't know that um i i think I would probably put it more in a familial pattern versus non, but I don't know a difference in, in children and adults. You know, all the literature will say that, you know, 30s to 40s is when they start becoming symptomatic. Um, but, and, and I, if I look back, I'll probably, I'd make my, my number a little bit lower in terms of my experience with it, probably in the 20s to 40s is when I'd see patients. Um, so, but I, I think in less familial, I don't know that there's that much difference. That's my guess. So, so uh, intracranial cavernomas have been associated with prior radiation. Do we have anything similar in the spine and cavernomas? You know, I, it's a good question. I, I think we tend to radiate spine less, so and with lower doses, so maybe. But I I can't say that I've ever had a associated cavernoma. I have had a few for you know long term EVMs and things like that. I've seen them in tumors. Um, but I don't think I've ever seen a, a spinal one that I could trace back to a radiation exposure. But it's a good, good question. Um, we are already 25 minutes uh, past nine. So yeah. if there are no important questions, can we conclude, sir, Dr. Bhutukumar and Dr. Singh? Sure, sure, sure. sure. It's been Great. very interesting, the whole discussion. I, oh, the yeah. presentations I've yeah. been yeah. supporting. Uh, all the four uh, webinars, this was the best webinar we had a lot of discussion and then uh, still people want to go ahead every time dr clemens will tell him to go close but this time he didn't send me a message he still <laughs> wants to, to continue the discussion um, i like to thank uh, our overseas guest dr clemens and dr babu for uh, uh, for being there all the time to to collaborate in our meetings and i hope in all years to come we'll be collaborating together I'd like to thank the panelists, Dr. Dr. Singh and Dr. Muthu Kumar, uh, who had lots of questions. I know they have more questions, but uh, we don't have time. And sorry for interrupting. And uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Satish, Dr. Babu, Dr. Raj Kumar uh, for preparing and giving a very lucid lecture. And uh, at least I learned a lot of things uh, from today's lecture, uh, how to manage hemangiomas. And uh, we supported by good uh, discussion 
good, very good cases by Dr. Sachin and Dr. Srivastav to bring about the points of discussion and points of controversy. Uh, with this, a few words, I'd like to conclude, but I'll not forget to uh, thank our uh, large sponsors, um, Mr. Jaru, uh, and support supported by Mr. Birender from INTA, uh, who have been always, all the time helpful in uh, doing this academic webinars. And they have also uh, told that they'll be supporting in publishing a book. So I'll be sending a request to write down the chapters also. Uh, with this, uh, uh, I'd like a concluding remark from Dr. Clemens, and then we'll bid good night and good morning to US participants. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I completely echo this. Uh, I think this was a great series. I'm looking forward to, for one, um, seeing all of you uh, in September uh, in Austin. Uh, we're working on this program. Um, and then also we'll have to look into doing this uh, again, I, I suppose, next year. You know, I, I think this was great. Um, we'll look for some topics. I'd uh, love to uh, participate and collaborate with you guys uh, some more. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And Mr. to send that group photograph to all of us. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Good night. 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 Thank you, Mr. Virender. Doctor, I think Dr. Uh, Mr. Jagdrup has left, I think. Yes, sir, sir, sir had just a few minutes before he had left. Sir. Okay, then. Just convey we'll the photos, sir. thanks to Mr. Ramakrishna will be sharing the photos, sir. Mr. Okay. Ramakrishna will be sharing the photos, sir. We'll share the photo. Okay. All, all Thank you. Sir. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll send it to everybody. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And please, please send the recorded one to um, the recorded uh, video recording of all the sessions of this session. This session. Sure, sir. Sure. Thank you. Okay, doctor. Good day, sir.